Good morning, West Coasters, and good afternoon to the rest of the country. My name is Michelle Deutschman. I'm the Executive Director of the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. I am so pleased to welcome all of you to our third annual Speech Matters Conference. Last year's conference marked my last plane flight and big group event before things closed because of the pandemic. And while I wish we could be physically together to network and share food and drink, I am grateful for the technology that allows us to connect and has allowed programming and outreach throughout the year. It has been quite a year full of heartbreaks and challenges. Today and tomorrow, as we chart the course for campus speech and engagement, we have the opportunity to look back and more importantly, to look forward to what is possible now that we are on the cusp of returning to physical life on campus. Over the course of the next two days, we have the privilege to hear from advocates and activists, scholars and students on a host of interrelated topics. Please feel free to share your questions with our experts by using the Q&A feature. We will do our best to address as many of them as we can. Additionally, real-time captions are available here in our Zoom conference room. Click on the closed caption button and select show subtitles to view the captions. Before we begin, I wanna thank some people who are integral in putting today together and to the life of the center overall. Brenda Pitcher, the center's executive assistant, is a master of detail and handling problems with poise and innovation. I wanna recognize Jonathan Schwartz, the center's brilliant intern who has been working with the center for the past two years. We're grateful to the Glen Echo Group for all they do to make the center look and sound our very best. I wanna extend our heartfelt thanks to our colleagues in the Chancellor's Suite at UC Irvine and at the Office of the President, all of whom are key to the center's success. And finally, I wanna thank the members of our academic and national advisory boards for their ongoing support. Nothing has been more top of mind in the past year than public health and science. And that is the topic we are going to begin this year's conference with. Um, on trust in science and public health. The moderator for this conversation is none other than the president of the greatest public university system in the world, UC President Michael Drake. In August, 2020, Dr. Drake became the 21st president of UC system of 10 campuses, five medical centers, three nationally affiliated labs, more than 280,000 students and 230,000 faculty and staff. Dr. Drake previously served as president of the Ohio State University from 2014 through 2020. Prior to OSU, he served in several roles at the University of California, including nine years as chancellor of UC Irvine and five years as the system-wide vice president for health affairs. An ophthalmologist by training, Drake received his AB from Stanford University, his MD and residency from UCSF, and his fellowship training at UCSF and the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. President Drake will be facilitating a conversation between two experts, NPR reporter Ping Wong and Dr. Mark Galley, Secretary of the California Health and Human Services Agency. Dr. Galley was appointed as secretary in 2019 by Governor Gavin Newsom. In his role, he oversees California's largest agency dedicated to healthcare and safety net services. Previously, he was medical director of the Southeast Health Center, a public clinic in San Francisco. There, Dr. Galley practiced pediatrics and led a transition to the patient-centered medical home model of care. In 2011, Dr. Galley became the deputy, deputy director for community health and integrated programs for the LA County's Department of Health Services. Dr. Galley earned his MD and MPH from Harvard, and he completed his residency in pediatrics at UCSF. Ping Wong is a health reporter on the science desk at NPR. She was NPR's first Reflect America fellow, working with shows, desks, and podcasts to bring more diverse voices to the air and online. She's a former producer with WBUR and PR's On Point and was a 2018 Environmental Reporting Fellow with the Ground Truth Project at WCAI in Cape Cod, covering the human impact of climate change. As a freelance audio and digital reporter, Huang's stories on the environment, arts, and culture have been featured on NPR, the BBC, and PRI's The World. Now, President Drake, I'm going to pass the baton to you. Very nice. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate uh, being here today and uh, really for all the work you've done, Michelle, during all the years, particularly this last year in helping to keep the enterprise moving forward. And I'd uh, like to um, get right into our discussion. We are uh, very fortunate um, to have Ping Wong and Mark Gailey with us today and um, uh, these issues that are 
so critical to all of us, our, our uh, great fodder for our conversation um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. So can I um, uh, begin by saying first, hello, and um, that, that I'm looking forward to uh, the, the conversation and that the University of California has had a long, a long role in free speech and uh, trying to foster the kinds of conversations that are the most important for, uh, for our society really to have. And these have been challenging times for, for these conversations. I, I, uh, again, the, the conversations are always challenging, can always be difficult, but this last year has been something really, um, really quite special. So uh, I'd like just to ask our two uh, panelists, both of whom I see and welcome, and um, nice to be with you this, uh, this morning or afternoon. Actually, I don't know, uh, uh, Ping, I don't know where you are. So I don't know, are, where, where are you physically now as we speak? I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. So it is actually afternoon for me. I'll say, great. I'll say good afternoon to you and good, and good morning to my neighbor, Mark. Uh, it's, it's been a very, very difficult year for fact-based professions such as journalism and, and public health and higher education. And could you each briefly describe some of the most significant challenges you faced when it came to messaging or reporting on the pandemic. And maybe if I may, I'll start with Ping. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks for that question. I mean, it's been a challenging year for basically everybody, um, but specific to my role as a journalist covering the pandemic, um, you know, my goals are to inform the public about a rapidly evolving public health emergency that could involve everyone. And I'll just name a couple of the categories of challenges that I, I feel like we've faced this year. And um, those would be political, cultural, and personal. So politically, I think um, many people would agree that there were confusing, contradictory messages coming from the country's leadership for much of the pandemic that made it really difficult for people to agree on some very basic facts, you know, that there was a deadly infectious disease that emerged and it was bad for humans and that the spread of it should be stopped. Um, and, you know, that was, as a reporter, if we as a country are not agreeing on on some basic sets of facts, it's very difficult to sort of come up with some cohesive messaging and a cohesive explanation for people of what's happening. Um, culturally, I would also point to the fact that, um, you know, there's been a real sense of pitting individual interests against the good of the whole society. And I think that's kind of a false dichotomy. Ideas like, well, I don't feel like wearing a mask, even if that's what's good for everyone else, or pitting individual businesses and the economy against public health. Um, that seems to me to be a false dichotomy and it's also very damaging. You know, it kind of makes it seem like we as a society are not working together to get rid of the problem. We're instead fighting amongst ourselves against each other and the problem is getting worse in the process. Um, I'd also say just personally, you know, everyone's circumstances have changed during the pandemic. You know, people lost friends, they lost family members, they lost jobs, and everything was and is very uncertain. And for me personally, one of the challenges that I faced was just um, spending much of the pandemic completely alone. You know, there was a lot of isolation that I felt and other people felt in terms of um, living and working um, during this pandemic um, while trying to go uh, about their lives in some way that made sense. So I would say those are a couple of the categories that I, I sort of felt when I was thinking about this question. Well, I, I appreciate that very much. And you're, you're right. It's a fascinating pandemic in that um, we all have different stations and places in life, but it's really affected everyone. There's no one who's not changed dramatically in the way their daily life moves forward from those, as you mentioned, in the most tragic cases who've lost their lives or been extraordinarily ill or lost family members to those who've lost jobs or businesses that may have taken a family generations to build. Uh, so on, on the one edge and then uh, just for everyone else, daily life has been uh, challenging and, and difficult. So um, this has been a year like like no other. Uh, Dr. Gailey, I mean, you uh, live this um, uh, every moment. Um, uh, can uh, I'd like your thoughts on the, the things that have been some of the most significant challenges you've faced? Uh, yeah, first uh, to Michelle Peng and, and you, Dr. Drake, thank you for including me in this exciting conversation. Uh, really echo some of the things Ping just mentioned. I think uh, absolutely uh, there's been other dichotomies set up. I'll go over a couple of those that have been striking to me. But I think first and foremost, uh, you know, there are certain infectious disease truths and facts about new viruses that many people knew and understood. But I think communicating those in basic, simple ways that ring true over the course of a pandemic, I don't think uh, 
people approached early on the uh, the response as something that was going to last as long as it has. I mean, I often say the way we talked about the pandemic in March of last year looked very different than the way we talked about it 12 months later, March of this year. So the fact that things were evolving very quickly about our knowledge, we we did uh, we we uh, I think uh, became uh, really uh, creatures of the fact that we had to communicate about something that was quickly and rapidly evolving. I often said for California, I wanted to be part of a state that learn the most and the fastest, but that meant integrating new knowledge and the message every single day. And the fact that we didn't have a sort of national approach to the pandemic, that states were left to really chart their own course day over day with different cadence of communications. There were definitely states that had daily press conferences and others that had, you know, every other week press conferences about this different types of leaders in the front communicating about the facts. I think the role of scientists and public health and clinical professionals uh, was very different. And the role of the chief communication officers in many states being the governor or other leaders, I think, created an interesting dynamic that I think some states did really well throughout the course of the pandemic. Other states sort of had bumps in the road as we went along. But I know here in California, the approach that we led with science and that that science evolved uh, over time, and we had a both an important responsibility to communicate that and incorporate it into our response. At times, I think led people to feel confused. And then the the other thing that I think we were up against, just sort of picking up on this idea that there were uh, different choices or dichotomies, was one where it was public health versus the economy, and so many of us early on said, well, we need to address them together, that the economic health of our state, especially over the medium and long run, depended on the public health successes early. And communicating that, I think, was particularly challenging, especially when we had uh, a, a significant degree of turning turning messages into not just public health messages, but uh, uh, political messages. And then the last factor, that I think uh, we we anticipated, but I think felt it even more than we anticipated it, was this notion of fatigue and that messages that worked early were uh, frankly uh, significantly less effective later. Uh, we saw that in communicating here in California restrictions to how people's personal behaviors might change. I think the things point so many people said, yeah, I can do this for the team for about six to eight or 10 weeks. But as you got into six to eight or 10 months, people started to feel so exhausted that I think the ability to communicate uh, effectively uh, the, the truth and the science was harder and harder as we went along. Well, thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. And you're right that the same message landing on ears during different times in the pandemic landed in uh, with different effects. And um, uh, we all have uh, experienced that. Um, maybe let me have you go to you first with the the my next question, which is what might be done to build more trust in the media and and in scientific experts during this moment. And as we move forward, is there is there a role for higher education maybe in that? And 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 what about research institutions? Yeah, um, coming to that part of the question last, I think I think one of the things I'm most proud of that we worked hard uh, on at the very beginning. And 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 look, um, together, science, health, and communications did one um, very uh, helpful thing. I think for us over the next five to 10 years, which is plainly make clear to folks uh, that inequities in our society are real and matter. The disproportionate impact, I think, was uh, picked up very, very early. I remember Chicago Tribune, New York Times articles in the first weeks of the pandemic highlighting the impact 
of COVID on low-income communities, communities of color, this concept of essential workers. I think we amplified something that so many of us in the public health and health community have dedicated our careers to, but with the help and um, you know, partnership with our journalism and communication colleagues, we amplified this in public health and for some states like ours, we've been able to carry that forward with a real policy direction that has mattered. But to bring that a little closer to the ground, I think uh, the media and I think states and cities and counties in the case of California have really uh, used trusted messengers, uh, it, you know, people that you don't always pull into the communication cycle, uh, the media cycle to tell a story, whether it's the effect of uh, COVID on them or their families, decisions that they made. We had one really important conversation with somebody in one of our rural counties, Madera County, uh, where a young woman who was probably the reason COVID came into the home, into her home and lost some family members, important grandma or grandpa in this case, that that message was very impactful. So using people who look like who experienced the same as some of our hard hit community members was very effective. And I'm proud of the way we did that. Of course, we can always do more public service announcements, other messaging. We've done a lot of that with testing and vaccination to get uptick to, to go higher in our case in California, really partnering with groups like our farm worker organizations to deliver messages. So I think there's so much that we can do, not just in the big media perspective, but really some of the, the messages that resonate. And, and we talk about trusted messengers. We talk about authentic messengers. I think the, the, the number of people who have helped with communication during this pandemic have, I think, brought some degree of credibility to the profession broadly that we don't always depend on, and I think we will more and more. As it relates to, to um, where academic institutions can help us, and we, we did this, but not until the fall and early winter in California. I think divisions of uh, behavioral science have a real role in helping us understand how we might have done the early months of the communication work differently. And certainly we have leaned on them, some of our UC colleagues uh, in different parts of the system, but beyond have helped us think about the beha behavioral health tendencies of individuals, what messages might work at different various times. So in our pandemic response, so the ability to connect early on with those professionals and those academics to help us not just be informed by existing research, but help us do even more research to allow the, the message to evolve over time. And I think that will help us. Obviously, the ability to connect dots from the state and federal level is going to be key. And I think one, one thing many of us wish we had more of was that consistent coordinated leadership, not just at the political or public health level, but even in our ability to tell stories. I mean, I think we all become used to the various different uh, news outlets that had quite different spins on the same story. And, and that has become more and more evident in, in uh, COVID than uh, many of the other issues we've dealt with. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Ping, let me just repeat the question again that comes to you, and it's what might be done to build more trust in the media and scientific experts during this moment and moving forward? And then also, is there a role for higher education in particular, especially research institutions? Sure. Well, building off what um, Dr. Galley said, you know, I'd say, you know, he talked a little bit about the need to um, connect uh, you know, real scientific information with people, I would sort of like to talk about the flip side of that coin, which is something I think academic institutions could really push forward on right now and help, which is um, understanding the misinformation and disinformation that has come out during this pandemic and, and sort of helping to understand where it's coming from, um, you know, who's propagating and perpetuating it and how to combat that. I mean, I think that 
you know, one of the things that we've seen a lot of, especially when it comes to vaccines and treatments and, you know, uh, is that in this place of uncertainty and in a place where, you know, realistically science and scientific understanding takes time to uh, evolve, you know, you need to gather data, you need to analyze that data, you need to sort of fill in the gaps of what's happening and answer the questions. And as that's happening, you know, people are anxious, they have a lot of questions, and there's a lot of misinformation that's filling that void. And so I think we've seen a real rise of um, inaccurate information really getting out there. And so I think um, academic institutions can really sort of help um, understand what's happening and, and how to combat that. Um, and, and sort of in terms of, you know, what's what can be done to build more trust in, in the media, um, you know, I looked I looked up a poll um, by uh, by the company Edelman um, and back in January, it found that trust in the media was pretty low. It was at 51 percent. It was hovering below trust in government and in business. And, you know, the report didn't get very granular, but my hunch is that it probably differs by audience and news outlet and also the, the experts involved. I mean, from my perspective, what's interesting is that, you know, during the pandemic, um, I actually observe and, and many others did too, that academic scientists actually stepped in to fill a void that was left by the government for much of this pandemic, you know, the federal government, um, you know, the CDC was largely absent from the public for, for months on end from the media's perspective and, you know, academic researchers and scientists really stepped up to inform the public, to share data, to share information, um, you know, Johns Hopkins University, for instance, has a, a tracker for the number of cases and deaths that's still considered to be um, the most reliable count by NPR and other institutions. So, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I think there is work to do to rebuild um, trust in the media um, and to sort of make it clear that um, that the messages that we are trying to share and and perpetuate are based on scientific fact and um, and are, are are accurate and reasonable and balanced. And so I think um, you know that that is a decision that sort of gets calibrated every day in the newsroom. But I think that there there is room certainly to to build on that. I appreciate that very much. It's been quite a year, as you said, with different uh, mixed messages. And I wonder if the Edelman study on how much media yeah, is trusted. I didn't read the study, but it'd be interesting if you asked the, the respondents how much their preferred media outlet was trusted. And I'm gonna guess you could get a really high level of uh, um, agreement there with the high level of disagreement that that media outlet was should be trusted by people who had another preferred media outlet, um, which is, um, um, yes, the sign of our times, I guess. Uh, so let me go to you, Ping, with this uh, the, the, the third question, which is that last week, the CDC declared racism to be a serious public health threat. And uh, what does this, or how does this change, or what does this change for the way we think about and tackle these issues mean as a nation? And how do you view, view the government's role and the media's role in addressing racial injustice as it relates to the public health space? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is a, a really big step, you know, the CDC declaring racism a, a serious public health threat. Um, and I think it's something that's been a long time coming. You know, last July, my colleague Selena Simmons, Stefan and I broke a story about CDC employees calling out the agency's toxic culture around race. And people then were saying, we really need to look internally and externally and grapple with the harm that racism is, is perpetuating to our health as a nation. So, you know, acknowledging that systemic inequities based on the contract of race is damaging society and people's health, I think that's a huge step forward. And you know, it's it's not really much of a surprise, as as Dr. Galley was saying. You know, the pandemic has really brought those inequities to the forefront. Um, I think the responsibility now is to sort of explain to the public what this means and how widespread of a problem it is, and how to really address it. I mean, you know, right now I think the media's role is to really shine a light on what's happening, to to sort of elevate the voices of people who've been working on this issue for many years but haven't necessarily gotten the airtime, and to and to hold leaders accountable to the goals that they set. You know, I think that this declaration is important. It's a sign of progress. And the question now is like, what, what will we do next as a society to really write this? Thank you. And Mark, same, same uh, question to you. Yeah, just uh, building off what Ping just said, I think the, the declaration is such a meaningful and important acknowledgement and step. And I think it comes in a year, as I said, where 
Uh, the COVID has unmasked in many ways additional uh, inequities and in how it really has become a matter of life and death. And the role of race in those inequities has been long understood by so many of us in public health and healthcare. And it's an opportunity to have those perspectives amplified and, and become part of the normal everyday conversation. I think the exciting moment for me, who has been part of the conversation for a long time, but been waiting for that opportunity where not just the declaration is made, but the commitment in a time where we have resources to invest in the alteration of those structural factors that drive racism and race as a public health crisis and issue, uh, the, the role of race in public health crisis, in our public health crises, I think is very, very important. And I know in California, the question now is what do we do to build on the momentum that's happening across the, the country? What are the immediate investments, one, and what are the long-term expectations? And part of it is making sure it's uh, our normal lexicon, what we talk about day in and day out. And for that, I think COVID has, COVID plus, uh, I mean, I don't want to overlook in any way the civil unrest in in the, the state which I was born and raised in, in Minnesota, at the heart, you know, the heart of so much in the past year, in the past couple of weeks even, um, that, that we have uh, other events beyond the pandemic, maybe spurred and related, but beyond the pandemic that highlight racism in our, in our communities and in our society. And how are we in this moment going to not miss another boat to really make the structural changes that we need to see? And so uh, in that way, uh, it's a real privilege to be in a leadership role where I can be in the room, voice what other people have uh, done in the scientific and healthcare community to really advance this idea and make real lasting change. Thank you, Mark. You know, and in speaking of, of equity and uh, the way the pandemic has affected people and then the way that we as a nation are responding to it, as well as other things in the broader public health space, let me just go to Ping. In, say, in your reporting, You've covered some of the equity problems involved with vaccine distribution. In what ways has the vaccine rollout nationally put vulnerable populations at a disadvantage? And what stories in vaccine equity should we should be getting more attention? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Thanks. I mean, it's interesting as someone who's been covering vaccine distribution since before it even started. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of thinking that went into how to give vaccines out in an equitable way. Um, you know, even before vaccines were authorized, the CDC's National, the CDC's Advisory Committee, the National Academies of Sciences, groups of bioethicists were reviewing how the pandemic had disproportionately affected people based on race and class, and they were making recommendations on who should get those vaccines, you know, based on the risks of exposure and the risk of severe illness and death. But in reality, what happened, um, and I'm sure Dr. Galley could speak much more to this, but the, the recommendations were considered to be very difficult to implement. You know, some of the criteria was job related, others were circumstantial and, and age related, and, and nobody really wanted to be the one to enforce who was getting the vaccine and not. Um, and so, in reality, you know, the process for getting and making an appointment prioritize people with access to technology, to, to go online and make those appointments, to knowledge, you know, to people who were able to know what was going on and, and know all the nuances of the weird ways that individual places were having in terms of making vaccine appointments, people with access to transportation, people with access to time who were able to take time out of their work days and jobs to go get a vaccine, sometimes very far away from where they lived. And so essentially it, it ended up making it a lot harder for the populations um, who were prioritized and who were most severely impacted to actually conveniently and successfully get appointments. So that was a huge problem when supply was very limited. Now we're in a place where vaccines are more available. There are more locations to get the vaccines um, and there are resources being sent to community centers for things like outreach and language translation and mobile vans are being deployed to communities that are hard to reach. So the situation is getting better. But you know, in terms of stories, I think in the media, what we need to be doing is tracking 
where the resources that are devoted to these efforts are going, you know, whether they're reaching the people that are intended to help, who's getting vaccinated. And according to the CDC's numbers right now, you know, vaccinations in minority communities, Black, Latino, and Asian are still lagging behind those of the white population. So there's there's work to be done. Appreciate that. You know, I have my own experience. I did um, a clinic in February that was a pop-up clinic on the street in the Mission District in San Francisco. And and I noticed the, uh, the diversity and ethnicity of the population there. I did one at a, a, a community mental health center that was a little more organized, not just not a pop-up in a tent, but a place where you made appointments and and, and all. And that was in um, uh, 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 what is traditionally been an African-American community. But I noticed that there are actually relatively few African-American uh, community members among the very, very diverse group of people who seem to have access to making an appointment and showing up there. So that was actually a, a surprise uh, uh, to me. And I, I know it's one of the, these things roll forward in challenges. It's one of the things that I, I know we have to face. And California has worked uh, very hard on this. I know, uh, 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 Mark, and um, there's been a lot of national coverage of uh, vaccine wariness among particular segments of the population. Uh, and I was mentioning the communities of color and difficulty in getting vaccines to those communities, but there's also been wariness uh, traditionally and historically that's been mentioned. And, and then lately, uh, Republicans as a political uh, category have been noted as being particularly vaccine uh, wary or hesitant. Tell me about California's efforts, uh, well noted efforts to try to uh, get vaccines broadly to people. Yeah, thank you um, for, for the question. And, and Ping, I think uh, uh, really grateful for your insights before and, and during this vaccine rollout. Um, Michael, I would say your experience around what, what we call uh, vaccine tourism uh, is notable. I also, uh, one of the first uh, experiences I had with vaccines was delivering them in South Los Angeles at a federally qualified health center that I know well, largely black Latino population. Uh, I, I said I'd never seen so many uh, visitors to this community as I saw that day. And uh, it raised early on the awareness that it wasn't enough to just make the allocations disproportionately to communities of color and communities where we knew we'd have to scale a taller wall, a steeper mountain to get across the message and importance of vaccines and then in the arms of individuals. So in California, we've done, done a lot. It started, uh, and, and I'll just emphasize one thing. We started out behind on an equity perspective. If we just look, and it was deliberate, we knew it was going to happen. We focused on people in the healthcare industry who are not, right, the frontline workers in hospitals, uh, uh, especially on the healthcare delivery side, are not people, low-income people of color. Right, there are physicians and nurses and other techs with degrees of education that that I think we started in that way appropriately on the focus on protecting the healthcare workforce. And yes, we caught the complete number of workers in those settings. So yes, some people of color, lower wage jobs, but largely we started out behind. And and frankly, I don't think the nation has ever caught up. Uh, and, and it starts in California with allocating vaccine to the right communities and the right providers. We, we actually have gone through painstaking detail to look at provider by provider performance on delivering vaccines to, to individuals and then some uh, unexpected uh, champions of equity have emerged and they have received additional vaccine. We've also deployed resources, both financial, media, and others to help support the communications. I often say uh, vaccine equity, like most equity work, is hyper-local, right? What works in one Latino community two miles away doesn't work in a similar Latino community. So really, how do we craft approaches that recognize and validate and appreciate the hyper-local nature. So this is funding different types of CBOs in one community. It might be the archdiocese in another. It might be uh, you, you know, a, a community center. How do you fund and create the connections between the ground troops and the vaccine providers? I think the point you made, pop-up clinics, mobile clinics, have been a key part of the strategy. 
allowing the traditional uh, digital divide issues to be combated by people who actually go door to door. I think some of the most exciting, successful things I've seen are the door knockers, the people who go in and and sit at the front stoop and uh, talk about vaccines. Uh, some strategies, you know, same mission site mission uh, vaccine location that you just mentioned, uh, the fact that they're doing work with people who come and get vaccinated and using the 15 minute monitoring period post vaccine to actually find out who else is in the household, what else can be done. So I think that we have uh, done a great deal, but need to do more in terms of communication and language, making sure that we're using trusted messengers, which then leads to the second part of your question, the focus on people sort of on different political sides of the political aisle, uh, the, you know, people who are historically uh, maybe more conservative view, have a different view on healthcare and vaccines and requirements and, and, and the push through government. Think again, using trusted messengers, California digging in more with some of our public safety professionals and leaders, whether that's in sheriff and police and fire, uh, working with our faith-based communities, the evangelical community, to get leaders who um, believe in, in the role of vaccine. And I think uh, another piece of the data that I'm looking forward to getting out into the world more and more, and we're seeing it in California, the CDC started to release it last week on quote, breakthrough infections, I mean, one of the strongest points is if people who are hospitalized with COVID are increasingly those who have not been vaccinated, but those who've been vaccinated are avoiding the hospital, I think we have a very powerful tool that can resonate with others if we tell that story the right way. So I think all of those are pieces of the response that California has used, both broadly speaking, but specifically with uh, some of our uh, uh, communities that have been traditionally vaccine uh, weary. Thank you, Mark. All the important questions. Uh, for uh, Ping, can can you give us some insight into the challenges involved in covering some of the worrisome elements in the pandemic story? Uh, for example, vaccine variants, or just um, a couple of weeks ago now, the pause on the J and J vaccine, and and then still reflect on the amazing reality of the vaccines in this uh, historically short period of time. Do you think public health messaging or negative bias in the news coverage has impeded vaccination efforts? Sorry, I was muted. Um, I think that's a really important question and, and one that is, you know, very present in our daily newsroom conversations. You know, how do you report on vaccine hesitancy without unnecessarily contributing to the problem? You know, and, and I'll take the J&J &J, um, vaccine pause, as you mentioned, as, as an example, because you want to, on the one hand, communicate things that are real and potentially scary to people while helping people keep things in perspective, you know? So I feel like there were different layers of the coverage around the J&J &J vaccine. The most general, I would say maybe the least nuanced question was, should I worry about this or not? You know, like that was something that people just wanted to understand, like, you know, is this something I should be concerned about? And yes or no, you know, but I, I think that the more nuanced question to ask was, what happened to cause this pause and how can we actually be minimizing the harm? And I, th I think that it's important to get to the deeper questions about this to help people understand the, the real fact that there are potentially serious, severe side effects that might be associated with this vaccine. But on the other hand, they're very rare and, um, you know, helping people contextualize the risk to themselves as being very low. Um, I think that those are, those are things that will help people identify and understand the risks to themselves and make better decisions for themselves. You know, I, I had a lot of conversations with my editor this past week about how to, how to talk about this, how to frame it, how to, um, you know, help people understand what the problem was in a rational way instead of a fearful way. And, and that's just kind of a balance that we try to strike in our messaging every day. Because I think at the end of the day, as a journalist, a lot of it is uh, about balancing, you know, what the audience wants and what we want to tell people. You know, people tend to want the hot take. They want to know how everyone else is feeling about something. And they also want to be able to make up their own minds. Um, and similarly, as a journalist, I want to tell people what's happening and I want them to also listen with reason and to react rationally instead of fearfully. So it's it's a balance that we try to strike every day. 
you know, it's a fascinating thing to think that um, in the way the stories are, are reported, um, uh, uh, an individual significant reaction to the vaccine would get more coverage than a thousand people dying from the virus or 10,000 people actually dying from the virus. I mean, it's it's a quite uh, uh, interesting the way our things that are unique or unusual uh, get a, a, a more focus. And sometimes that can tip the, the balance. And so it really has been a, an interesting challenge for us. Um, uh, and I, but I have uh, two questions actually for you, um, Secretary. Uh, I say Secretary Galley, it's written on my screen as Secretary Galley. I'll use first names, Mark, uh, uh, and just say that. Forgive me, but but just thinking about that, this that there are two questions, are, Mark. One is uh, variants and your feeling about variants, and there's this great pressure on the the virus broadly to find escape variants uh, opportunities. So I'd love to hear a word about that, and then I want to have a, after that a question more about public health generally. But let me just hear from you on yeah your feeling about that uh, on uh, on April 20th. Uh, the, I know it changes daily. And, 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 and then I'm just going to pop in to say I, I would like to jump in with a couple of the audience Q&A after you finish, Dr. Galley, because we only have a few minutes left. Yeah, yeah I, I, thanks, Michelle. I'll be brief on, on this. You know, first off, uh, I think the public assume variants are a new and surprising thing. And I think we do have a responsibility to communicate that this is what RNA viruses in particular do, right? They, they do mutate, they mutate a lot. Some of those mutations are meaningful, others aren't. So for those of us who are at this moment, nobody is surprised that we're dealing with this. I think though we're in this situation in California, especially so other parts of the country, a little bit of a different story, but we really are because we've enjoyed low transmission to date. Uh, I think our test positivity has almost never been this low at 1.3% uh, uh, as it stands today, that it really is this race in some ways of getting people vaccinated, reducing transmission, reducing the likelihood that uh, replication will be variants that replicate and new mutations that replicate get passed on. So for us, it's really how do we just amplify the vaccine administration work in the face of variants that, uh, you know, we need to continue to keep our guard up, but people are tired and our biggest tool right now to fight variants is getting vaccines administered to as many communities as possible. Appreciate it. Michelle, you have questions you say from the audience. That's great. So let me just uh, pass over to you to, to share uh, uh, those. Okay. First of all, thanks to all of you. Um, I'm sorry to have to jump in and, and cut the discussion short. Um, a couple different things. Um, you know, one of them, um, you know, Dr. Galley, I don't know if you can speak to this, is um, from an audience member who's asking about how do we trust public health in public health communication when it doesn't prioritize Every, including everyone with universal accessibility, for instance, in social media communications like captions and alt text, um, you know, and how can you speak to that sort of massive inequality with only sighted and or hearing people um, accessing graphs or infographics and, and so forth? Yeah, I, I mean, look, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to learn and evolve. I think we have done a lot to recognize the inequities and the impact of COVID on the lives of people with disabilities, with um, other, other, uh, other needs. But we, we really, uh, I think every single uh, news conference I had, had uh, sign language interpretation, but not even in language interpretation. And it took us a while. So, you know, for a state as big as California, we didn't do as much in Spanish as we would have liked to. And I think this is an important opportunity for us to, to really figure out moving forward, because we will have public health media campaigns and conversations moving forward. They may not be, hopefully won't be as intense as we've had this last year, but I think it is a real opportunity in getting back to this issue of where do our academic and university partners come in. I think this is a tremendous place to relook at some of those opportunities and how we could have seamlessly done a better job. No, well, thank you so much. Um, I think we probably only have time for one more question. And I'd like to pose it to each of you, including you, um, President Drake, which is really, What's the biggest lesson or one of the biggest lessons you've learned um, from communicating about this pandemic, you know, over the past year, 
another way to phrase it was, you know, what would you might have done differently if you could go back to March or April of 2020? And and Ping, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Sure. Um, so uh, what are some of the biggest lessons? That's a, that's a bit of a tough question to sort of riff on, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, I think one of the biggest um, lessons that I've learned in this pandemic is the the importance of communicating uncertainty. You know, there's so much um, there's so much that was not known in the beginning of the pandemic in terms of how the disease transmitted um, and you know. Uh, you know, what parts of the body it was affecting, some very basic science questions. Um, but even as our scientific knowledge of the of the disease evolved, there were other uncertainties that emerged, you know, like what was the trajectory of the pandemic and, you know, how would people respond to it? And I, and, and so I think one of the biggest values that we have as, as journalists is to not only convey the accurate scientific information, but to also accurately convey what is not known about a situation and, and how you know, different scenarios could affect different outcomes. And so I would say that um, reporting the full picture, including what's known and what's not known is something that I've been really striving to do and, and that I've sort of realized is really important in terms of maintaining the trust of the public and explaining to people why we think one thing's gonna happen, but why it might not necessarily happen in the future. Okay, thanks. Um, President Drake, do you wanna jump in with any lessons learned? Yeah, I think that, um, golly, lessons learned or or um, uh, 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 principles uh, verified or underlined or or exhibited, I think, is, is uh, uh, how I would uh, address this. What a couple of things I think are important. Once it, it, one is that we've seen the uh, importance of uh, uh, of inclusion and diversity. Uh, broadly across our country in so many ways that the uh, circumstances of the decisions that we make under stress and in times of un uncertainty are such that the more you have people from different points of view as a part of the conversation, the more effectively you can reflect things that one or another person in the group might not see. And any group that we put together who and, and who looks at the same at an event, if you ask everybody who looked at the event what they saw, no one will see exactly the same thing and no one alone will see all of it. But if you put the group together, you get the much more nuance and much more understanding of what happened. So I think diversity and inclusion uh, were shown to be important in all of the things that we do and and, 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 and in many ways. Another thing that I think was uh, clear here and made clear, something we've known but was made clear is the importance of leadership, the importance of integrity, the importance of accuracy, sh uh, kind of shockingly important. Uh, I, I would say because we found that people could be either not either led astray or not led in the way they needed uh, to, uh, to move, and that the the effects could be devastating. People could pay for that with their lives, uh, but still, and uh, nevertheless, be led in ways that were to their disinterest for no particular purpose. So that was sort of um, stunning uh, to see, and uh, and then I think the uh, importance for all of us in kind of maintaining a focus on our values, those things that are important to us, those things that matter to us and why, and knowing to, to continue to plot that straight, that course toward that, I'll call it the North Star or whatever, but that that uh, to, to plot a course toward those things that are the most important to us and why, and then do what we can to support uh, those, uh, those values and make decisions based on that. I'll, let me finish by saying th things like the importance of family and, and community and love, in our lives. And when we look at the, the virus and what it's done, is it's really interrupted our ability to interact with other people, our families, uh, those things that are the most important to us and, and how we really have to remember what's important and then work in ways to maximize our ability to uh, be able to celebrate those things as we as we move forward. So, so, yeah. so well Anything said, thank you. Dr. Galley, I'm gonna give you um, kind of the final word before we close. Yeah, a, a couple of things. First, a, a pickup on themes already shared, but I, I think one is um, communicating uncertainty, but also the thing we knew early was things would change and being able to communicate effectively that change would happen and we would incorporate that change into our thinking and our policy. One of my uh, uh, common questions uh, that I received sort of 
in the middle, in the fall, in the winter was, well, back in April, you said, reporters would ask me and say, hey, you said in April. And I finally said one day, well, April was like a lifetime ago in COVID knowledge, right? If you hold me to what I said, based on the knowledge we had back then and the approaches and the tools we had, I wouldn't be doing my job if that's what I depended on today. So how do you communicate that early on, that things would evolve and change? Because I think that led to, quote, confusion. And we could have anticipated some of that earlier. And, you know, certainly friends like Peng and others on the sort of reporting side, we should uh, work together more to figure out how to thread that needle. Um, the other thing is we often had our messages feel like everyone needed to do the same thing. Uh, and we would give broad sweeping messages to all parts of our state and our community. And the truth is because the pandemic affected people disproportionately based on the community they lived in, some other um, uh, you know, differences, I think we might have done a different job, a better job of communicating what, what people in different situations needed to do to get through this in a different way. And this still holds true on vaccines, right? When we had scarcity of vaccines, there were certain people that we really needed to get vaccinated early, certain communities, and not have it be in, in every one piece. And then the, the last thing, and this is probably the appropriate way to end, rather than looking back, the opportunity looking forward. Um, I have called COVID the great unmasker and the great accelerant. It has ma unmasked so many things that we have seen or thought of in society like inequities, disparities, um, except, you, you know, many other things. Um, but it also gives us this incredible chance to accelerate change at a moment when we're, we're in this funny situation because uh, in many states and because of the federal government's um, relief, we have resources to really build a structure and infrastructure that's quite different than the one we had going into the pandemic. So how do we use the lessons moving forward, all of the things that we talked about today and so much more to really build on investments that allow us to have a very different type of response, God forbid, we have in five years or 10 years or 20 years or 20 decades from now, uh, a similar challenge because we use this as an opportunity to build thoughtfully together moving forward. And that's the hope I think I bring to the role and the job today. And, uh, and I expect that everyone on this Zoom wants to see us succeed in that way. So we have a better, brighter future for those those uh, who are going to be picking up the pieces and for our young people uh, moving forward. Well, listen, I am grateful to the three of you for sharing your time and your expertise and your insights. And I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation in the future. So thank you. Um, you know, for everybody who's on with us, you know, this thread about facts and truth and information and disinformation is going to continue during our next session, um, which is about challenges to truth and uh, disinformation in the digital age. Before we begin, um, we're going to ask our audience members a couple of questions. In a few minutes, you're going to see um, a poll um, come up on your screen, um, and we'd like to take your temperature on a couple of things related to disinformation. Um, first, uh, the first question is going to be, have you ever believed an article or story and then later found out it was not completely true? That's question one. And then Two is, have you ever shared an article or story and later found out that it was not completely true? And I'm going to, this is, of course, anonymous, and I'm going to ask folks to be honest, and I'm going to ask you to take a minute to participate, because I think this will be an interesting and fun way to kick off um, our next discussion. So go ahead um, and take a moment to fill out your poll. And while everyone is doing that, I am going to introduce you to um, our fearless moderator for our next panel. Um, and that is David Green, the Senior Staff Attorney um, and Civil Liberties Director at Electronic Frontier Foundation. David has extensive and significant experience litigating First Amendment issues in state and federal trial and appellate courts. 
and has written and lectured extensively on many areas of First Amendment law, including as a contributor to the International Encyclopedia of Censorship. Before joining EFF, David was, for 12 years, the Executive Director and Lead Staff Counsel for the First Amendment Project. I'm going to welcome David, and I'm hoping that um, we can show the results of that poll. As we bring David on. Ah, okay, so let's take a, a quick look and um, our other panelists can join us. So have you ever believed an article or story and found out it was not completely true? That's 80% 80, 80 of folks. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And then 50% of folks um, for sharing an article or story. So I think this is interesting, especially in light of the fact that most of the couple hundred people on our Zoom today are part related to higher education. And so to think if this is the percentage of folks um, kind of in, in this you know, realm, what, what will it be um, in other ones as well? And with that, I'm gonna um, let David introduce you to our fabulous pan panelists and I'm gonna disappear. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and I do, I think the poll is a real nice way to set up the discussion uh, we're, go we're going to have here um, about, about this information. Um, I am, as Michelle said, I am a, a free speech lawyer and typically I'm on, I'm on panels to uh, explain all the legal barriers that exist uh, to try to regulate um, disinformation and actually the significant uh, protection that the, in the US legal system that the First Amendment affords uh, even even false speech um, and the hazards of giving uh, giving governments the power and how the power to, pu to punish false statements gets abused by less democratic governments. So I'm really actually happy that we're not gonna talk about regulatory solutions today. We're actually gonna talk about non-regulatory approaches um, and, and even the challenges of, of non-regulatory um, uh, approaches uh, to disinformation. And I really start, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let each panelist um, Introduce introduce themselves. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, offering each one uh, a question um, and to ask them to introduce themselves um, and and uh, the work they do in this area, and then to answer this question, which is you know how do you define disinformation, and that is you know how do you define uh, this panel, some this the problem of disinformation. And so I'm going to start first with uh, with Renee Duresta. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to the uh, conversation. Um, so I'm at Stanford Internet Observatory, and I would say you know, the definition that we typically use for disinformation is uh, information with an intent to influence, but an intent to deceive. There's some component of deception to it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily translate to content that is false. Uh, it can be the actor, for example, that is the, the element of, of, uh, of deception, like a uh, Texas secessionist, that's really a Russian troll. Texas secessionism is a legitimate political point of view. It's not necessarily falsifiable claims. It's just an opinion. Uh, but if you're presenting those claims when you are not actually a Texas secessionist, when you are in fact a paid operative in Russia, uh, then we get into an element of deception. And that's where the disinformation component comes in. And, and Renee, I've heard you uh, also speak before about authenticity. And I wonder if you can comment on that a bit as well. I think authenticity was sort of the, I would argue, low-hanging fruit, and maybe we can kind of get into that in this um, in this conversation today. But um, the idea of authenticity as something that that was more important than truth. You know, the platforms didn't want to be arbiters of truth. We didn't want the platforms evaluating the substance of the content. Um, the question of authenticity came into into play around this idea of uh, is the person that you're engaging with who they say they are? Is the person who is uh, you know the is there a real journalist behind that account or is it a sock puppet? Uh, is there a real person behind that account or is it a uh, manipulation campaign? And authenticity was one of the ways that scholars and the platforms chose to uh, assess disinformation, again, not in the context only of the content, but in the context of the behaviors around the content, how it was spread, uh, and the voices behind the content, who was actually creating this, uh, this material. Great. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, to Ebony Rice. So, Ebony, uh, same question. Please introduce yourself. And then, how do you define disinformation and the problem of disinformation? Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, as David said, I'm Ebony. I work with the News Literacy Project. And we are a national nonpartisan uh, education nonprofit. And our work focuses on providing educators 
and the general public with resources, programs, and support to be um, active consumers in news and other information and to teach how to discern fact from fiction in news and other forms of media um, so that people can be equal um, and engage participants in our democracy and in everyday civic life. Um, and we believe that one of the primary solutions to the misinformation problem that we find ourselves in uh, and the disinformation problem that we find ourselves in is uh, education. And so we primarily work with teachers, but we also work with the general public um, to provide supports to understand and to um, combat mis- and disinformation. Um, my work really focuses on connecting with educators in regions across the country on the ground to work together to figure out the best way um, to get news literacy education in schools across the country. Um, so I helped to build our local footprint on the ground, um, which is why this topic is so important. Um, and we really define uh, disinformation. I think Renee said something really important, which is um, the intent behind it, which is so difficult to know when you're looking at your news feed, like what someone's intentions are. But disinformation, um, is primarily created to cause distrust. Um, it usually manipulates and inflames um, something happening in society at the moment. Um, it's very chaotic um, and it's false and misleading intentionally. Um, and it's usually intended to advance a political or ideological goal um, and on the other side of it. So uh, we defined disinformation as something primarily created to um, create distrust or to manipulate something that's already happening um, in a way that is chaotic and that advances some type of um, underlying agenda. So I have a, a just a quick follow-up. So we saw, you know, in the in the poll, almost I think fifty percent of the respondents said that uh, they had believed they had probably had spread around something that was inaccurate. But I think they would all have asked, say, they probably didn't have an intent to deceive people. Are are they? How do we? How do we? Are they part of the problem? Are, are, are half of our half of our participants part of the problem, or because they lack the intent, um, is it? Are they not? Well, I would say, um, and I would love to hear um, what uh, Alice and Renee say about this, but. I would say, so there's this like larger moniker of, of misinformation and many of us, if not all of us have shared something before um, online or otherwise, it just like wasn't true. Um, without an intention, you either thought it was true. So you were sharing information that you found valuable or helpful with family or trusted friends, or you saw something that caused some type of reaction out of you. And you were like, other people should know this information. And you just shared it. And maybe later it came out to be true. Or maybe you don't know whether it's true or not, but we just have all fallen victim to this, which is inherently um, a, a part of the issue um, that it is so easy to share. It's so easy to pass along information um, because vetting it, feel that's something that we're we're like learning how to do. But sometimes our natural inclination, when we feel some kind of emotional or some kind of tug to have a response to something, which is why um, this information is so um, is so dangerous because it spreads so quickly. I mean, there's so many stats about how quickly um, incorrect information spreads online. And so I'm saying all that to say that. Um, under this large moniker of misinformation, there are things that we just share because we didn't know whether it was true or not, or it came from a trusted person, a celebrity, or some kind of figurehead, a political, um, uh, someone in politics that we trust. And so we saw something, we shared it, and we thought it was true. And that, um, based on what we understand uh, disinformation to be, would not be considered disinformation. It would just be misinformation that was shared, probably with a pure intention, um, but yet was dangerous and caused um, potentially some kind of harmful effect at the end of it. Great, thanks. Uh, Alice, same questions. Please let it, let everyone know who you are and, and what the, and the work you do, and, and how do you define disinformation and, and the problem? Sure. Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Alice Marwick. I'm a qualitative social scientist and I'm a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, where I'm a principal researcher at the Center for Information, Technology and Public Life, where we look at the relationship between emerging technologies, information and democracy. Um, and part of my work looks at media manipulation and disinformation. I'm especially interested in the context of disinformation, whether it's 
the communities and spaces where it's generated. A lot of those are sort of these fringe communities or extremist or far right communities. Um, and I'm also interested in how people interpret disinformation and how they take it up. Um, in terms of how we define it, I think that you know, we've already seen a little bit of a difference just in the panelists today. I personally think of it as information that is strategically false information that's spread purposefully, um, usually for an ideological or political purpose. Um, I'm also really interested in how I think disinformation, I believe, is sort of inherently political. It's often linked to identity, and it's also often linked, I think, to questions of inequality and perpetrating inequality. And and where do how, how do we the, the the current discussion we have now about disinformation, how does this sort of fit in historically with other? I mean, did I don't think any of us think that disinformation is like a is a new phenomenon or even strategic uh, disinformation. How do you see this sort of fitting in with um, you know, in the historical context? That's a great question. So if we look at our current moment, it's really been since 2016 that people have been really focused on disinformation. And if you do a Google search or anything like that, you'll see that there's been like this huge increase in interest in disinformation since then. But if we think about disinformation as something that has a long history, we can see a lot of antecedents to today. So for example, one of the projects we've been doing is we've been looking at um, historical episodes of disinformation that at the time we probably wouldn't have so thought of as disinformation, but now we can look back and see that they were. So one example of that is during the Reagan administration, there was the perpetration of this harmful racist stereotype called the welfare queen. And it was based on this like one woman who was sort of a, she wasn't, she wasn't like your average welfare recipient. She was like an actual like con artist. Um, and from this, the Reagan administration came up with this idea of a woman, usually a black woman, who was sort of scamming the welfare system and was getting like thousands of dollars in welfare benefits that she wasn't entitled to. And she was spending this money on like fur coats and Cadillacs. Now, this was a ridiculous stereotype. It had no basis in reality. It was flat out racist, but it was used over the years to justify really big decreases to welfare and really harsh restrictions on who could get welfare and the kinds of people who deserve public benefits. And so we can think of this as strategically false information that was spread for an ideological reason that had this sort of outcome of increasing inequality. And when we think about disinformation outside of like, you know, 2021, we also have to realize that there's things besides social platforms where disinformation is spread, that you see disinformation spread in more traditional or legacy forms of media as well. Um, things like cable news, um, talk shows, podcasts, um, as well as what we would think of as, you know, mainstream social media and also fringe forms of social media or social media like Telegram or WhatsApp and things like that. Um, thanks, uh, Renee. I'm wondering if you have a take I, I, on this, on what the role that sort of you know social media platforms, which get a lot of the attention now, um, in terms of 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 being uh, vectors for misinformation. What role do they play, sort of in a in a larger misinformation yeah, so ecosystem? We try to understand disinformation contextually as a form of propaganda, right? And and so this is where I think that um, you know we're not always a hundred percent in agreement as researchers on which term to use and where. And I think that you know this is sort of a matter of interpretation to some extent. But we see it as propaganda and. Propaganda has always evolved to fit the technological um, affordances of the day, right? And so propaganda in the era of the printing press back in the um, you know, 1300s looks quite different than propaganda once you have uh, mass media and television broadcasts. And so the form of the messaging evolves. You move from long form journalistic narratives, the kind of Cold War propaganda, Cold War active measures and disinformation campaigns where there's a front media property. And back in the olden days, you had to actually work really hard to establish those front media properties. There was, you know, there were actual spies on the ground. There was money changing hands. There was agents of influence like meeting in dark alleys. Now in the age of social media, you throw up a Facebook page, there's your front. You, you know, use a virtualized alias, a, you know, modernized agent of influence. Um, and you communicate with people over DMs to try to entice them into, you know, doing your work for you. Um, but what's happening is the, the, Social media is, I would argue, kind of like a channel in media. And, and we, we treat it as like two separate things because 
the affordances are a little bit different. It's very democratized. Ordinary people can make these aliases. Ordinary people can create these fronts versus media, which has a you know different degree of um, requirements that go into uh, the establishment of something that has a broadcast license, for example, or you know ways in which um, the requirements are a little bit different. But ultimately, what we see is information really ping ponging back between the two. And I'll, just as a specific example, um, you know, in early narratives around coronavirus, Chinese state media was doing something very, very overt. They were putting out misleading claims about the origin of the coronavirus, but they were doing it using their very overt attributable channels. And they were doing it with blue check influencers on Twitter, you know, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs accounts that were, again, echoing the same kind of content that was on uh, on their state media pages. But then what you see is this full spectrum where you see the creation of fake social media sock puppet accounts that also begin to come up and become the fake kind of vox populi. They're out there saying the same things that social that the state media is saying, but they're saying it in a much more subversive way. They're saying it as if they are just ordinary members of the public who also think these things. And so we see a lot of information campaigns today as, as having this, um, this sort of full spectrum where social media and media Again, they're talked about differently because there's differences in uh, the capabilities and in the way they are regulated or not regulated. But ultimately, it is um, holistically using the entire environment to create a popular perception. And this is where we see it being a lot more akin to um, a facet of propaganda. So, so I have this question then for, for each of you. Uh, you know, given in our current state, when, when it might it be particularly difficult for a consumer, of a, a, an earnest consumer, well-intentioned, earnest consumer of information uh, to, to distinguish between truth and non-truth. I'm sorry, David, can you repeat the question? When is it difficult to distinguish between truth and non-truth? Is that the question? Yeah, when, when, it, when yes, that's that's right. When is it, when, are there, are there specific situations where it's where it's particularly difficult? for a consumer of information to distinguish between truth and non-truth? Well, I think, first of all, we can't always assume that what is true and what is false are like really clear things, right? There's a lot of debatable political issues, for example, where based on your political position, your identity, your sort of like partisan identity, you're going to believe that different things are true. And some of those things are things that, yes, we can say this is true or this is false. Like, I don't you know, I don't believe like, for example, the QAnon conspiracy, that is that is false information. But there's other kinds of information, I think, that aren't necessarily so clear cut. When we're talking about things like coronavirus or vaccine hesitancy, yes, we can say these are, you know, these things are wrong. These things are not true. These things are being spread. They are unclear. But there's a lot of other things that there's more of a gray area. And I think that's when we get into sort of this like hyperpartisan media and ideologically biased media, where some of the narratives that are being pushed are more exploitable because there is a little bit more of this like room for debate and discussion. Um, so I think depending on the context and the type of information you're talking about, there may be things where, you know, even, even two very, you know, knowledgeable people might have a difference of opinion about something that's true or false. Um, so I think what, a lot of the time what we need to be doing is thinking about, okay, well, what are the, who is harmed by this type of information? What are the, what is the impact of this type of disinformation? And centering communities that are harmed and centering sort of the harmful effects of information that is, is, is clearly false or information that has these sort of negative outcomes, I think is, is really important. So, Ebony, I want to turn to you. There was a there was a, a question in the in the Q and A about um, about if there are efficient ways to to persuade uh, you know, consumers uh, of information of truth. But I want to talk about your work, which specifically focuses on news media. Um, and so, can you talk a little bit about the interaction of quality based journalism? With the current channels for disseminating, with the current channels that uh, people use for disseminating and and uh, and getting news, um, and how that affects the spread of disinformation. Sure, sure, uh, it's a good question. So, um, I think it's important to know, um, kind of right off top, that 
information is really the fundamental element of democracy. So it's it's the thing at the forefront. And journalism is a core component of news literacy. So certainly our work centers journalism and quality-based journalism like at the center of the work. And so when I say, and when you say quality-based journalism, what we mean is um, organizations, news organizations that follow the um, standards of quality journalism, which are verification, sourcing, fairness, accountability, and context. And in the past, there were three major um, white male-owned um, news outlets that everybody, for the most part, got their news from. So it was clear because there were th- there were just these few stations that people kind of got their information from um, as it related to news media. Now, however, there are so many forms of um, media. And so I think it can get a little bit confusing because people can choose who they want to listen to. People can choose who they choose to watch, who they choose to believe, um, how they want to engage with information and how they want to ingest it. Um, And so we believe that it's really important uh, to center and to talk about the standards for quality based journalism, because we understand that when people know what those things are, then you can hold um, news organizations accountable. And I'm specifically talking about news and not other forms um, of information, but you can hold um, organizations accountable. You can discern when something is maybe an opinion piece versus when something is a news article that's been vetted and sourced. You can find um, the links to something when you're sharing something on Twitter and you see a quote from an article. If you see the actual link back to the article, you can kind of just go back and check it out for yourself so you can follow some of those standards standards for yourself to make sure that the information that you're ingesting, but then also the information that you're sharing is actually information that is true. And and another reason why this is so important is because we believe that citizens uh, should know how to analyze um, information. We believe that um, this type of information, that journalism is really at the center of societal issues, of, of challenges, of determining political priorities. Like this is really the things that our society is made of. And so if people can understand how to assess information. And I don't mean like going back and checking sources every time, you know, you calling sources every time you see a news article. But what I mean is I'm seeing who the uh, quotes are from. And if, again, there's like a link to the article what the context of the article is. So when you see a quote on social media or something, finding the actual context of the quote instead of like taking the quote out of context and then kind of turning something that um, was meant for one thing into something totally different. Um, And that's so easy to do. And we see it all up and down our news feeds, but we also see it um, in a lot of the different forms of media we consume because we have so many options um, that are afforded to us. So one of the real tenets of democracy, as you all well know, is free speech and being able to kind of have this right And so we believe that along with that comes the responsibility and the importance for us to um, help to educate uh, the next generation on how to really sift through this incredibly complicated information ecosystem that they're in. I mean, it is the most complex climate that we've we've seen in, in human history. And if we aren't empowering students particularly, but also the general public with the sensibilities to sift through information, then we are actively disempowering um, young people from being engaged civically and from participating in the actual fundamental aspects of our democracy, which are free speech, um, the right to a free press, and to be able to understand um, how to engage with information that they see both online and otherwise. So we hear a lot about fact-checking as a tool. Um, for combating uh, misinformation. I'm just wondering, what does that, do you, is that an effective tool? Where does, does, that, where does that fit in, uh, in the toolkit? Um, I'll say really quickly, I think when people say fact-checking, they probably mean a few, a few different things. Um, we, I, some of the things we talk about are things like lateral reading, which just means like you're reading an article and you just open up another tab to just check um, whatever it is that you're reading, check it against other things. Um, Maybe not particularly articles, but like you see something online and you just want to verify it. Um, We also talk about reverse image searching, which um, allows you to take an image um, and see if that image has been somewhere else online. So you can see if that image has been manipulated, how many versions of that image exist. So we try to talk about, there's this uh, infographic that we have, which is really great. um, And it's called four ways to sanitize your news feeds. And it just offers four really quick ways it's it's mainly you meant for social media but for really quick ways to like tell if something is um is false that you're seeing online or not 
Um, and it only takes a few seconds. And so when we talk about fact checking, we're just talking about like a quick check before you um, before you share something. And the first step actually in that check is to not act on your emotions. And there's so much information that we see that manipulates our emotions. And it's sometimes it's intended to do that because it um, preys, as Alice mentioned earlier, on like our identity. So you see something and you become come inflamed and then you share it or you comment or you perpetuate a message that may not actually be true because there was something that like rose up in you to do that. Um, so when we talk about fact checking, we talk about just kind of taking a moment really quickly, um, reading the comments. A lot of times people have already outed something that isn't true. People have done the work for you. They posted the real article. They falsified something. People are so quick sometimes online, you don't even have to do it. It's already been done for you. Um, just the spread of misinformation because we recognize that each of us are like somebody's we we have an audience with somebody if you're sharing anything over text message online what have you um there are there is a trusted circle of people who listen to you and believe you um and so just doing a quick check these things just take seconds um to do is so beneficial and really helps more than we know so, Alice, I want to ask you, just uh, going off that, you've written uh, and, and studied uh, how QAnon followers uh, evaluated sources and the spread of QAnon. So how does that how does that fit here? What are the, the what, what can we learn from that uh, about the challenges we face trying to you know, elevate quality new sources if we think that's a, at least one tool to combat this information? Yeah, so I think this goes straight to the heart of what Ebony was talking about, because um, so QAnon, you know, as some people, you know, probably know, it's this sort of conspiracy theory that holds that there is this sort of like elite of people who are satanic child eating pedophiles. Like that's really what it is. That's really what these people believe. And unfortunately, it has much broader uptake than you might think. And an increasingly large percentage of Americans believe this. And there's actually some um, evidence that this belief is actually being pushed by foreign adversaries because it's a destabilizing belief, because the people who believe QAnon are also people who don't tend to trust traditionally democratic institutions. They don't trust our elections. They don't trust sort of government. Um, it, it's, it's really something that is an anti-democratic um, theory fundamentally. Um, and as a result, we can't really just write off everybody who believes in QAnon as people who are very gullible or people who are very silly. Like this really is a problem that we have to tackle. And part of that is understanding the problem. Um, and so myself and one of my graduate students, we spent about a year hanging around in QAnon spaces and sort of watching what QAnon people do when they're sort of coming up with their theories and when they're evaluating things. And what we found really surprised us because these are folks who think of themselves as critical thinkers. They believe that they're practicing media literacy. They spend a lot of time talking about the importance of citing sources and the importance of doing their own research. And in some ways, those are the kinds of things that I encourage my students to do in my classes. So what, what's happening here? How are these people able to believe in these conspiracy theories that are completely false while at the same time they believe that they're doing their research? And the answer to that is that what they think of as doing research isn't what I would think of as doing research or what you know Renee or Abney or David would think of as doing research. They don't recognize traditional journalism, like say the New York Times or CNN or NPR. They think that these news sources are not factual. They believe that this is part of an elite that's lying to them. And so anything that is sort of reported by these traditional media sources, they think of as false. So they're going to sort of reject anything out of hand um, that the traditional media puts in front of them. So as a result, their research is more about making connections and connecting the dots. It's almost like a game, like they're trying to excavate these hidden knowledge. And so what you see is a lot of QAnon people, they put together their own databases and they'll work through things like flight records or they'll go from Wikipedia page to Wikipedia page or they'll go through LinkedIn or they'll you know try to trace the dots between people who invested in other people's companies and the things that they see as evidentiary are not what you or I would think of as evidentiary and then they're building on a house of cards right so they're starting with a very shaky foundation and then they're building these theories on top of them. But what this points to is it's not as simple for these folks as saying, well, here's the actual fact, right? Or here's a New York Times article about this thing that you're concerned about because they're just not going to believe these things. So one of our challenges as researchers is 
how do we reach people like that? And if you have people in your lives who have gone down these rabbit holes, you know how difficult it is to sort of turn people back once they've gone down these pathways where they're really believing things that are completely different from what the mainstream media is telling us. So, you know, one of the things that we're working on now is we're trying to think about how do we work with people with these extreme belief systems um, because tools like fact checking that work on you know most people are not necessarily going to be as effective in those types of communities and unfortunately i'm not i don't have a solution <laughs> for this problem but it is something that i think is really worthwhile and very worth thinking about it's, it's a renee i want to turn to you because there's a bunch of questions in the chat about you know, how this is putting a lot of burden on, on users <laughs> to try and sort through all this information, especially, you know, in the context of COVID um, and, and public health information and it, it changing all the time. And, and I know that you got into this area by really looking at um, vaccine disinformation. So I wonder if you had, can briefly, you know, respond to people. What are the what are the tools? What's a what's a person who actually wants to get accurate information or wants to educate their friends about accurate ed, education, uh, uh, public health information and COVID vaccine information? What are they to do? Yeah, it's a really big challenge. I mean, so and 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 I think it's a very nuanced challenge. So first, um, what Alice was was referring to this question of uh, who do you trust, right? That is such a fundamental core challenge that is bigger than media, that is bigger than way bigger than social media. That's really a kind of a fundamental um, social issue, which is there's a astonishing lack of trust at this point in media. It has grown over time. A lack of trust in institutions and institutional authorities. And one of the things that's really remarkable, as, as Ebony alluded to, I think that we are in a very transitional moment in time. You know, I, I, I hesitate to say that because I think it, you know, <laughs> there's always the risk that like you've kind of forgotten history. But I think when you look at major pivotal moments in collective sense making and how people come together and make determinations about things, there is there are these moments of upheaval punctuated throughout history that follow significant technological shifts. So effectively, you have a technological shift, changes the way people receive information, changes the way people communicate, and leads to you know kind of a period of um, reorienting. And in this particular case, the question is, you know, what are the levers at our disposal to help with that reorientation? Well, there's education, media literacy, things that we've described. There's policy. There's the roles that um, you know regulators and uh, ways that we think about what how information um, should move perhaps, or you know, should be curated is another way of describing that. Um, and that's you know, the kind of levers there are a combination of regulatory, but also design. Platforms can rethink and, um, and come up with more reliable mechanisms for curation, right? Uh, to help decide you know, what is surfaced. Is it just, um, is uh, virality above all else or engagement above all else necessarily producing um, the most uh, informed community of people. But one of the areas where there's a real challenge here is that, as you alluded to with COVID, anti-vaccine information is very, very, very old. You know, again, goes back to um, the 1800s, the inoculation against smallpox. Um, so the idea that there are anti-vaxxers who have misguided or incorrect beliefs is, is not new. What's interesting today is the way in which the ecosystem privileges anything with high engagement and thus amplifies, inadvertently amplifies those points of view. So no one is arguing necessarily that they need to be removed from the platforms. That's something we've kind of started to see a little bit more action on now in the context of COVID. But really, one of the key questions has been, can we simply not amplify it? Can we simply not surface it where it's there, but you have to go looking for it as opposed to a recommendation engine proactively pushing it? The other area where this has become a real challenge with COVID is that COVID is an example of an evolving body of knowledge where we don't actually know what is accurate. And so that's framed somewhat reductively, particularly by people who are interested in further eroding confidence in media and authority as, oh, the experts just didn't know, as if that means that uh, the experts have, have failed or faltered. Um, COVID has been really interesting in that the experts have had to evolve their communication about a disease as they understand the disease. And so we have people who are expecting in information to move at the speed of the internet, where every time you open you know, Twitter, you would see something new about uh, COVID, how it was transmitted and what cures would work. I I'm sure you all remember like doom scrolling just about a year ago today, where we we're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. 
But information, actual reputable information about the modality of a new disease doesn't happen at the speed with which we refresh our Twitter feed. And so you have this gap. And in that gap, you have opportunity for people to come and provide knowledge that may not actually be reputable, but you know, you've got kind of like maybe a 50% chance, you know, maybe you get lucky and you're the guy who says the thing that actually does turn out to be true. Does that mean that you have just become a de facto expert that, you know, that people should look to for health information in the future? No, it actually doesn't. And so there's some real interesting questions here about how do we think about authority and its intersections with expertise? How do we think about institutions and their intersection with expertise? And do we move towards a model where we as a society are, you know, recognize that we have this, this kind of time horizon gap between the information that we see and the reputability or, or, or re, you know, reinforced validity of the information as coming through a scientific process. So again, this is, I think this um, transitional period as we're trying to, you know, come, come into new ways of uh, making sense of facts in the age of mass virality. So I, I want to make sure we have time to actually, you know, I want to move the conversation a little bit to our, particularly how this applies in the in the university environment and and on campus and and um, and so I'm I'm wondering what do you or do each of you see as the university's role in the battle against disinformation and maybe what are the particular difficulties or context where the university, where a university environment needs to be specifically concerned or active um, in addressing uh, disinformation. Now, who wants to go first on that one? <laughs> um, I, can, I can tackle that a little bit. So one of the things that we're concerned with right now, especially you know, with the name of this conference, the Spe Speech Matters, is the fact that universities are increasingly becoming a area where these battles over disinformation are taking place. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the classroom. One of the things that we're really concerned with is that there's this sort of idea right now that professors who are um, spreading, who, who, who write about or research about certain topics um, are caught in the crossfires of sort of harassment campaigns online. A lot of those are around disinformation. Like they'll talk about, they'll take a professor's comments out of context or they'll, uh, they'll accuse a professor of, of doing something or other with their research. Um, and then there's this movement to have students tape their professor's lectures and put them online, uh, make, make them susceptible to criticism from outside forces. Um, or in the worst cases, you're talking about junior researchers like graduate students or untenured professors or adjunct faculty who then are attacked for doing research that might be controversial or that might have a, you know, a political component to it. And what we see is that universities are generally not very good at dealing with those types of things. Um, if you have like a graduate student, for example, who's getting attacked online because they're doing a project on something or other, and their department is getting a bunch of phone calls about them or a bunch of complaints, a lot of the time the university, it, it does not really understand that this might be an organized harassment campaign and that the graduate student might not have done anything wrong. And often it's just, you know, they tell the graduate student like, you take, get off the internet or keep a lower profile or something like that. Um, and so one, some of the things that we worry about is when this disinformation really uh, sort of overlaps with these harassment campaigns and professors get caught in the crossfire. We believe that universities need to support their faculty, especially their vulnerable faculty, like graduate students and adjuncts. Um, and they also need to understand that the classroom needs to be a space of intellectual exploration. It's not about indoctrinating students, but it is about professors. Professors have to have the ability to discuss things like critical race theory or white privilege without worrying that their, their lectures are going to get taped and put on the internet and criticized. Um, and so right now, I think that there's a lot that we're seeing sort of the beginning of a lot of these battles play out in, um, in, in educational spaces. Um, and it's definitely something to kind of keep an eye on and watch out for in the future. I think I see this problem as a little bit distinct from, from disinformation actually. And I think, I think that, um, I, I think that one of the things that's happening is we're trying to figure out how do we engage in collective sense-making? How do we have conversations about hard issues? How do we 
facilitate open di- open dialogue. And, and you know, and as somebody at a university, I think that the debate and the pushback and the you know the dynamism of of discussing ideas is something that is so critical, so critical to the spirit of inquiry. And one of the things that I think is happening is that as harassment on the internet, I think is a, is a, has become such a concern for so many people because the impacts can be so profound. And so you can see the there but for the grace of God go I moments, right? And so it has potentially uh, chilling effects on how people speak and how they engage because they're afraid that somebody is going to screenshot what they, you know, screenshot a comment, audio record it, post it to Twitter, try to get them fired. Such a broad spectrum, you know, happens on, it's like a scalp for a scalp. One side does it, then the other side does it. And so I think that there is this concern that, you know, that has rendered the ability to have those conversations. um, it, It has really limited them in a lot of ways because of the concern that that is going to happen. I don't see it so much an issue of disinformation as an issue of trust and safety and social media writ large. I think that these two things get blended together a little bit because of the um, the fact that oftentimes they all get kind of lumped under the, the broad rubric of content moderation. Um, the reason that you, you know, the way and the, the mechanism and the means by which you moderate a coordinated inauthentic network or a coordinated disinformation campaign is separate and distinct from the way that you would moderate your kind of -of run-of-the-mill harassment. The -the run-of-the-mill harassment does figure into disinformation campaigns as a tactic at times, but it is also sort of a separate and distinct problem. And I think that there's a little bit of a a blending of these two things together in a way that um, when when there's actually some some separation there. Abedi, what what do you see as the, the university's role in the battle? in the battle against this information. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I have a strong argument um, there. We mainly work um, at the upper elementary through 12 level. I mean, but even still, uh, there are a few educators that we work with who um, teach freshman courses and so on and so forth. But um, we kind of see the intervention happening way before um, the university level. Um, yet and still though, I think that what we're kind of agreeing on is that there, there has to be some like intervention made, um, and particularly in the education sector is just one of the really important ways that that gets to happen because that's where, um, free thought is encouraged or should be encouraged. That's where, um, to Alice's point, intellectual curiosity happens. And so our, our goal is that students are really learning um, how to think and aren't, you know, of course, being indoctrinated into anything, um, but are certainly learning how to kind of understand these very, very complex um, things on their own. And so our hope is that that happens um, before they get to um, the higher education level. So that way, by that time, um, hopefully there's some fostering of um, really collaborative and engaging conversations that don't lead to um, any type of harmful harmful things on behalf of the educators, the university, or the students. Does, I'm wondering if any of you have a thought, does, does university have a role in directing debate? I mean, if you have an environment of you know, open, in, open inquiry and you have students who are at a point developmentally where they're, where they're, they're starting to you know, to question, uh, you know, conventional conventional thinking, and, and may want to challenge majority views. Um, what's how does university sort of balance these interests in in wanting to you know prevent the spread of harmful disinformation, or even itself being a vector of harmful disinformation, with also the value of of encouraging you know open inquiry and and you know the healthy skepticism and. Um, you know, and and the challenge to to conventional views that the students the students want to challenge. Anybody have any great ideas? <laughs> I um, take that. I'll I'll share something I think is really important. So um, NLP recently, in like the last few months, um, released a lesson on conspiratorial thinking. And um, again, it's for um, middle and high school students, but the point is um, it really kind of goes into the history of conspiratorial thinking and really talks about and analyzes um, kind of how certain conspiracies came to be. It doesn't focus on specific specific conspiracies, but it really kind of um, hovers over the point that 
uh, conspiratorial thinking isn't new. And there are a lot of things that um, certain lines of thinking that we see manifesting right now are building upon and have been building upon for a long time. But it's kind of just now coming into this like um, kind of coming into fruition in a way that we've never seen before. I think 2020 was just the perfect storm for that. And so we see that um, in a way that we hadn't before. But one thing that I think is really important that I appreciate it is how students can see and understand um, the historical context as it relates to a lot of the things that they're seeing today. And I think when you understand that, when you can balance what you're seeing now based on um, the, the historical context of, of certain themes and ideologies, then you can start to develop for yourself and you can have healthy skepticism, which is encouraged. You can uh, question things in a way that's pr uh, productive and constructive um, in a classroom setting. And we think that um, the university level, the uh, K through 12 level, those are just the perfect environments to foster that type of information sharing, that type of collaboration and understanding. Um, and so I think one a really important thing is really understanding and, and explaining the history of not just conspiratorial thinking, but the history of mis and disinformation and, and a lot of the themes that we're talking about. And then I think students and we'll start to have a more healthy understanding and appreciation um, for a lot of the things that uh, we're talking about today because they'll have kind of the historical context to to really ground these conversations. Yeah, so I teach at a the oldest public university in the United States in North Carolina, which is a purple state. You know, it's got the, it's got so many of the diverse the diversity that makes America interesting. And my students come from a huge variety of backgrounds and communities and political beliefs. And my job as an educator is not to be didactic. You know, it's not to try to indoctrinate them. It's to try to give them the tools to learn in today's complicated media environment and to understand that just because they see something on Instagram or whatever doesn't mean that it's any, you know, that it's any more valid than something that they might have seen on a supermarket tabloid 25 years ago, right? Um, so I really love working with undergrads, but when you're 19 or 20, you know, you are at your most like fiery, uh, like idealistic. I, and I was very obnoxious when I was that age, right? Like I thought I knew everything and I thought my political beliefs were 100% correct. And I disagree with a lot of the things that I thought back then. So I understand that about my students, right? But I think we have to meet them where they are, right? It's not about saying, oh, you're so wrong. And how could you think that? Like your whole family, to, no, you, that, that's going to turn people off. That doesn't open anybody's minds. You have to sort of encourage them to think, like, as Ebony said, think historically, think contextually, like bring their life experiences to bear, but also bring the sort of intellectual rigor that really good universities encourage in their students. Um, so I think it's about being having empathy for your students, for having an understanding of diversity and an understanding of their experiences and trying to, as a professor, maintain your open mind, right? To not be closed off to learning from your students or from understanding that, you know, they are coming from a different point of view than you are and that the best way to, to reach them is to meet them there. And can I add one thing, um, David? So um, I think what Alice just said was really important, particularly um, on kind of circling around this idea of cultural competency in this conversation, because I think by the time you get to, um, especially like the, the college level, um, there are things that you're, you've learned, not just from the media, but from your families, from your parents, um, wherever, from whomever raised you um, and reared you that you've learned. And all of that you bring to the classroom and all of that you bring to, um, to wherever spaces that you enter. And so I think it is also really important to um, approach this work with the level of cultural competency and not to like rid every every conspiracy theory off as like, well, that's just crazy because there are a lot of historical and very valid reasons why certain communities um, in mass believe certain things over other things. And there's very good reasons for that. And so I think allowing students to understand like the full broader picture of something and then letting them make up their own minds and their own decisions and not hiding what was once done um, that was harmful and now kind of led to something that's just really hard to reverse now um, is, is very difficult and allowing students to wrestle with that and allowing universities to wrestle with that and educators to wrestle with that tension so that students can um, 
kind of draw their own conclusions and come up with their own ideas. So I want, we have time for one last question and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a, a hard one. It's one that I have myself too, because most of you know, my career as a public interest lawyer, I've, I've done a lot for 20 years of represented journalists. Um, and, but most of the journalists I represent aren't affiliated with major news organizations because they used to at least be able to pay lawyers. Um, so I've done a lot of work with independent journalists and also journalists working, operating in non-democratic societies. Um, and a lot of the metrics that get used in terms of assessing quality journalism or trying to elevate some sources, you know, can have a human rights implication of disadvantaging journalists who don't, for example, have the privilege of being able to put their real names on their work. And so in some of the fact checking models, one of the things that elevated journalists was, you know, do they have a pseudonymity and you know, a, a rule against pseudonymity? So, so we had a question in, in the chat, you know, is there a risk of honoring traditional media or mainstream media um, that imposes an orthodoxy? Does this marginalize new and innovative thinking? And the, again, does it have a human rights dimension for, um, uh, for for journalists operating in societies that where there is not an institute where the institutional media is actually government controlled media, um, and that the only independent media is those that actually operates outside that system. That's a really hard last question, but I'll, I'll let you try and answer it. <laughs> any any of you trying to answer that? Take a stab at it. <laughs> Um, I think that there have been a couple, there's a couple things there, I think, related to how we process media and how we process emerging media in particular. Um, it's kind of an ongoing debate on social platforms in particular, because, again, many of them really rely on the infrastructure of social networks for independent journalism, because it provides those things that, you know, that we talked about earlier, the, the means of production, if you will, that are uh, otherwise uh, outside the reachability of, of many, many small orgs. Um, one of the things that we've seen is is actually attempts to label state media. So in countries where there is a you know strong state media uh, component, even if it doesn't have the state media obviously um, named in the you know, the country of origin named in the in the publication itself, there's movement to help um, educate people about educate consumers about where the content is coming from. I think for independent journalism in particular, though, there. The, you know, there's a storied history in the U.S. of important pseudonymous um, writing and, and speech. And I don't think that, you know, this is where I think that the idea that um, necessarily, uh, you know, it, it is not de facto inauthentic uh, to be using a pseudonym. And so one of the areas that I think is very interesting that is emerging now is the sense of um, kind of persistent pseudonymity? Um, is there something where there's kind of a continuity there as we see this for users who want it also, particularly users who are in parts of the world where they are potentially penalized for their speech in very serious ways? Uh, so is there is there something to, uh, to, to kind of follow that, that thread over time, uh, establishing an idea of an identity that's not necessarily tied to a true name, but tied to a sort of uh, sustained series of engagements over time, perhaps? Um, and then I think on the, on the subject of um, do we run the risk of recreating <laughs> the manufacture of consent by only surfacing the, um, the mainstream media? Of course. And, and I don't know that anybody is really arguing that that is a system that we should want to go back to. I think that social media has allowed for this proliferation of voices. It has allowed for this proliferation of speech, particularly in places that you're describing where there are um, highly filtered or controlled media environments. And so it has provided an opportunity for these new publications to, um, to emerge. I think that the question of how social media should curate those is an open question. I think that there are ways to evaluate whether a journalist is pseudonymous or not. Is the content accurate, right? Is, is, there a, is, it, um, is the content, um, does it meet other criteria that one would establish as being reputable or authentic and using other signals versus uh, solely a person's name in deciding how to think about how to weight that content uh, across the, you know, the, the amplification programs that the platforms are using. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to jump in here. Um, I hate to end this conversation. It clearly could be the subject of the entire conference, but I really want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of you, to Alice, to Renee, to Ebony, to David, um, for such a thoughtful um, discussion and so insightful. And as a lawyer myself, I also was so happy that we didn't really talk about the law. Um, so I'm gonna thank you, and um, we're gonna move on actually to have a little video um, coming up where we're gonna focus on. Um, our fellows program. Um, many of you know that um, our fellows program is one of the cornerstones of um, the work that the center does. And in light of world events, this year's fellows class has been completely virtual. Uh, this, however, has not precluded them um, from forming a connected cohort and accomplishing their research goals. They are a truly incredible group. And while I wish all of you could interact with them in person, I'm glad we have the opportunity to showcase them and their work in this video. Each year, the Center selects fellows from a broad range of disciplines and backgrounds that are interested in tackling challenging and timely issues pertaining to expression, academic freedom, and campus life. Our third class is an exceptional group of individuals representing students, professors, law enforcement, policymakers, and senior administrators. Their research centers on complex topics such as student activism, student leader information networks, targeted harassment of faculty, and the relationship between students and campus law enforcement. And while the past year has been difficult in so many ways, they've continued to engage with members of their campus communities and have found new and inspired ways to move their research forward. We're excited to present their work to you early this summer. But in the meantime, let's hear what they're doing to safeguard and encourage the free exchange of ideas while ensuring the institutional values of equity and inclusion. My project is called Undocumented Students at the University of California System, Free Speech, Civic and Political Engagement. And it aims to uplift and elevate undocumented students' voices UC-wide through research and advocacy with the goal to improve and create new policies and practices to better serve and protect undocumented students and their free speech. So the primary goal that I'm trying to achieve with my fellows project, which is focused on using social media data to identify um, basically discrepancies or asymmetries with respect to how good the information users are receiving from their social media feeds um, is and how that varies by political orientations. My project examines the relationship between Black administrators and Black student activists on college campuses. This project came out of another student activism project I'm working on. When I was interviewing folks for that project, it became clear that Black administrators had a particular experience when it came to activism, especially activism related to race and in which there are interaction with Black student activists. My project for the UC Center is about institutional values and how schools like the University of California can promote its values while still respecting the First Amendment rights and academic freedom rights of those within the institution that might not share the same values. My fellowship project is to create a curriculum around the attempted Nazi march through Skokie, Illinois that occurred almost 50 years ago. The march was a real clash between the values of free speech and those of the tolerance and safety of a community, as Skokie, Illinois had the highest percentage of Holocaust survivors in the United States at the time. The curriculum is really designed to get students to participate and to engage on First Amendment issues and understand the different perspectives of both the community, the ACLU, the judges, as well as the broader groups of people in and around the Chicago area and the press as they all played a role in this controversy. I think one of the really cool things about our collective project and our coming together to work on this is that, um, you know, Ali has a really good understanding of the police use of force, and I come from a student affairs background. One of our goals is to understand the frequent conflict that occurs between student protesters and campus law enforcement, and we are doing that by answering our research questions. My project is called Tweets, Threats, and Censorship, Campus Resources to Help Support Faculty Through Incidents of Targeted Harassment. There are two main project goals. First, I'm conducting interviews with faculty who have been targets of harassment by members of the public. This could be harassment from individuals or harassment that's organized by groups of people or organizations. 
Through these interviews, I'm examining incidents of targeted harassment and considering the potential silencing and self-censorship effects of these experiences. My fellowship project has to do with the tensions between free speech um, and diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts on um, college and university campuses. And in particular, I am um, trying to get in touch with chief diversity officers um, to understand how they sort of deal with these tensions. In particular, what kinds of issues do they face um, and what kinds of strategies have they used to try to deal with these things. So the inspiration from my project came from a conference panel I was on last year. We were talking about free speech in the classroom. And of course, uh, in the conversation, the topic of uh, so-called self-censorship came up. And I counted that this, of course, could reflect a problematic dynamic in a classroom, but also on the, at the same time, you know, don't we want students to moderate their speech sometimes? Um, don't we all, as people living in a community with others, stop ourselves from saying things that might be hurtful or offensive to others at times? Um, and hopefully, pretty frequently, actually. Um, and I could see some people in the audience uh, nodding and clearly following what I was saying, and some folks just reacting in horror. Um, and this made me realize that we really need a much more complex way of thinking about how students actually think about their own and others' speech in the classroom. The relationship between media and what constitutes our common understanding is more important than ever. Campus-based activism is certainly a part of the media discourse. So for the past couple years, I've been working with colleagues to develop a measure that specifically focuses on understanding how campus organizers, be they staff, faculty, or students, uh, implement their particular interests or ambitions through different types of organizing and activism ta tactics. Keep an eye out for the release of the 2020-2021 Class of Fellows research this summer, followed by a series of interactive Fellows in the Field digital workshops. Learn more at freespeechcenter.universityofcalifornia.edu. Um, if that video piqued your interest, feel free to reach out to our center fellows. We'll be announcing the 2021-2022 class of fellows in the coming weeks. And speaking of fellows, our next guest was part of our fellows um, program's inaugural class. Um, I wanna welcome Keith Whittington to our, uh, Zoom, our Zoom stage. Uh, Keith is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University and the chair of the recently and the chair of the Academic Committee of the recently founded American Freedom Alliance. He writes about American constitutional law, politics and history, and American political thought. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Texas School of Law, Georgetown University Law Center, and Harvard Law School, and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's the author of several books, including Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech. Keith, thank you for joining us. I wanna give a special shout out to the students from your Free Speech and the Law class, who I understand are joining us also. So before we begin, um, Keith and I wanna survey the audience with the poll question that we came up with. So in a couple of moments, you are going to see a question on your screen. It's gonna ask you about whether you consider academic freedom to be primarily an issue for faculty and students on the political right, primarily an issue for faculty and students on the political left, or an equally pressing issue for faculty students on the political left and right. And after you do that, you're going to answer whether you think there is currently a greater threat to academic freedom than there has been in the past decade. So I'm going to give folks a minute um, to do that. And once we have a second to look at the results, uh, then Keith and I will jump into our conversation. All right, let's see if the results are coming up. And while we wait for them, we can always uh, do a basic. Maybe we should we should start with that. Uh, let's let's start with the basics, which is, oh, hold on, just kidding. Here we go. <laughs> Breaking news. Breaking news. Okay, uh, is it primarily an issue for, okay, majority of people are saying equally pressing for faculty and students on the political left and right. 
And then for the second question, it looks like a little more than the majority are saying, yes, it's a greater threat than in the past decade with a significant number of folks saying they're not sure. So I think, Keith, the first question is, you know, what do you think of these results? Is it what you would have expected? Is it what you've seen um, in other in other you know surveys? Obviously, we have a small sample size. <laughs> and, and probably a self-selected group as well. So, uh, so I think I'm not terribly surprised that people think it's uh, a worse situation uh, than it's been. Than, uh, say 10 years ago. Um, for example, I think there's a widespread sense inside of academia um, uh, that uh, uh, speech in general, both students and uh, faculty, um, is under a great deal of, of stress these days um, compared to what it was um, uh, not very long ago. Um, I am actually a little more surprised by the um, uh, degree of uh, feeling that this is a, a broad-based challenge for faculty across the political spectrum. Um, it is certainly true in my conversations with faculty on both the right and the left that they feel this pressure. Um, uh, but I think it's also true that a lot of people tend to imagine um, that it's only folks like them um, that are facing these stresses and that somebody else on campus must be having a much better day than they are in this regard. Um, and so I'm actually a little encouraged uh, that at least those uh, taking the poll um, uh, think that it's such a widespread problem because I think it is a widespread problem and I think we're better off if we recognize um, just how wide wide-ranging wide the problem is. And as a consequence, as we're trying to do with the Academic Freedom Alliance, uh, bring together a very broad-based uh, group of people um, to try to protect these uh, threats rather than just think, uh, well, it's just a little a corner of the world in which we have these problems. Um, and so we only need to worry about ourselves. We don't need to really worry about everybody else. I think it's critical the faculty recognize this is a problem we all share and we ought to be trying to uh, rally around this common interest. Yeah, well, I love that there's a and something encouraging that's coming out of, um, of this conference. But before we get into sort of the nature of the of the issue and and, and the details about AFA, um, let's go to the basics, which is what is academic freedom, and then also how would you distinguish it from freedom of speech? Because I think sometimes people are confused by those different circles and the Venn diagram of where and how and if they overlap. Yeah, there's certainly some degree of overlap between free speech and academic freedom issues, but um, uh, and, I, and I think actually my book, Speak Freely, I, I did not spend as much time as I should have on academic freedom um, as such and be as clear as I could have been on distinguishing between the two things. Um, uh, because they are somewhat different and they um, uh, they they rest on somewhat different kinds of considerations. Um, they have different drivers and different limitations associated with them. Um, so traditionally speaking in the United States, we think of academic freedom as really resting in three basic buckets um, as sketched out in particular in the 1940 um, American Association University um, uh, professors report. Um, and that lots of universities in the United States have wound up adopting and integrating into their own uh, governing uh, documents. Um, so in one bucket is a protection for faculty to do their research. Um, the faculty ought to have the freedom to uh, do research and publish their scholarship uh, without um, university administrators censoring the content of that or punishing them uh, for the content of their scholarship. Um, secondly, faculty have a right to teach. Um, and that they ought to be able to do so without um, undue uh, restrictions uh, from, again, university um, administrators. But that comes along with certain kinds of limitations associated with it. So faculty are expected to um, stick to the actual content of the course and not bring in um, unnecessary and irrelevant controversial content um, to a particular class and, and use the captive audience of their students um, to convey unrelated messages. Faculty are expected to convey professionally competent competent knowledge um, so that you are not um, spewing things that your discipline as a whole would hold as completely false information, um, but you're conveying it to your students as if it's true. Um, and so that freedom in the classroom also comes with certain kinds of professional limitations um, on the basis of it. And so we don't think of that as, as, as a lectern in a classroom as strictly speaking being a free speech forum uh, where you can say whatever you want to um, as a faculty member. And then the third bucket is what the AUP characterizes as extramural speech or sometimes inter real speech, speech uh, about in public about matters of general public concern. And that's where it looks most closely like free speech broadly construed. Um, that is to say, it's simply a right um, to be able to speak out on things that matter to you, that might matter to the general public, um, and voice your own opinion um, in that regard. And those may, may well be opinions that have nothing to do with your own act academic expertise. You're not speaking on the, on the basis of your academic expertise. You're speaking out on the basis often um, simply of your own personal views, just 
just like any other private individual um, in, in America. And so on, on that dimension, uh, things actually do start looking very much like a, like the free speech dimension. But I think we overshadow and lose sight of um, important aspects of the differences if we sort of blur what's happening on social media, for example, uh, with what's happening in the classroom or what's happening uh, in people's actual scholarship. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and to piggyback on that and on a kind of one of our poll questions, you know, why why do we do you feel like we're hearing so much more about academic freedom? And do you actually think that it's under siege in a different way than it has been, you know, since 1940 or even since the 1915 AAUP declaration um, was in, in instituted? Yeah, I, I certainly um, uh, always want to caution people not to imagine there was ever a golden age when academic freedom uh, or free speech, for that matter, on college campuses was ever perfectly protected. Um, it's a long term challenge to both um, understand these principles adequately implement them appropriately and defend them um, from threats. And there's often been threats uh, to faculty being able um, to pursue what they're doing. The reason why the AUP was founded at the, early, at the beginning of the 20th century was precisely in order to try to improve the situation, which was then quite bad. Um, uh, we've struggled all through the 20th century to try to expand um, academic freedom and it often have been very successful, I think, in getting us into a better situation um, over the course of the 20th century. Um, and so it's important to try to salvage what we've gained um, and preserve it uh, moving forward. And part of what's changed around universities now is, is I think, the rise of the internet and social media. Um, the faculty are much more visible. Students are much more visible uh, to the general public. Um, on the one hand, that means the general public is, uh, is, is more easily exposed uh, to the unfiltered views of faculty, um, which are not always pretty um, and, to, and can generate um, controversy. It's also much easier to know what happens on college campuses. And so one feature of social media and the internet more generally is every time there's a protest, every time somebody gets shouted down on a campus, suddenly the whole world is potentially aware of it. Um, and that can, I think, really skew our perception of what's actually happening on campuses, how bad the situation is. It gives people the wrong impression about what university life is actually like as a consequence. Um, and that can lead to some backlash against college campuses that can be quite troubling. Um, now we're seeing some of that backlash um, from uh, uh, government officials and politicians, for example, who are unhappy with what they think are happening at college campuses. Um, sometimes their views about what's happening at college campuses is not necessarily as well informed as one would hope. Um, and one worry I think we have to have at this point is this dramatic polarization that's occurring in general in society um, that seems to be having specific consequences for academia. So we're now in a situation where Republican leaning voters, for example, are much more distrustful of higher education than they were even a few years ago, uh, whereas Democrats are still quite supportive of higher education. That's not a very sustainable um, situation to be in, in in the long run. No, absolutely not. And I imagine that some of these forces were a significant part of what led you and, and other colleagues to form the Academic Freedom Alliance. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about AFA and how it's distinct from like a longstanding group like AAUP or distinct from newer orgs like Heterodox Academy. Yeah, there's certainly other um, organizations occupying this space that are doing very important work. Um, I think the problem in some ways is that the volume of cases is so severe that the threats we're, under, we're facing now um, are so daunting um, that we really need as many voices as possible. I've really come to view this as a sort of all hands on deck situation um, that for uh, many of us, me included, um, had other intellectual projects we wanted to be spending our time on. Um, but I think that this is essential to what universities are going to look like down the road. Um, and it's important then to try to do what we can uh, to, to improve that situation. That means in part the faculty themselves need to be speaking out. You can't simply rely upon um, outside interest groups to take the, all the lead on this. So an organization like the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, for example, I think does a tremendous job on lots of dimensions, um, but it's not a faculty driven organization. I think faculty have to uh, give their own voices to these issues. The AUP did uh, critical work um, throughout the 20th century and building in these protections on university campuses. Um, uh, but there, there's a limit as to uh, what resources that organization has available to it to continue to defend these um, principles in, in all circumstances. I think one thing we have now is a good legacy of these earlier fights and that university documents, um, sometimes statutes, sometimes uh, judicial opinions uh, relating to First Amendment protections are often quite favorable um, to academic freedom and free speech issues on campus. Um, 
and so in many ways, the challenge facing us now is how do we uh, successfully implement those and get universities to actually live up to their commitments uh, rather than having some of the early fights that were necessary to even get the commitments made in the first instance. Um, I think it's also true that we just shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, that um, uh, the nature of faculty work is changing dramatically, has been changing dramatically over time uh, in ways that tend to undermine these principles. And so while all university professors um, in teaching and research positions should be enjoying academic freedom. It's part of the principal commitment is that they have academic freedom. The practical realities of effectuating their protections of academic freedom depend a lot on whether or not they're on tenure track or tenured faculty and whether or not contingent faculty are just extraordinarily vulnerable um, uh, to uh, uh, campus administrators who um, turn against them to outside forces or forces on campus who turn against them in these speech controversies. And so while uh, tenured faculty are quite vulnerable as well, uh, contingent faculty are in just a very difficult situation. I think in the long run, um, uh, as AUP has been advocating since the beginning of the 20th century, if you want to make academic freedom uh, protections meaningful, um, part of that has to be um, including tenure protections um, to make it harder for universities to fire people uh, when they find themselves in the midst of these speech controversies. Absolutely. So I know that AFA is young, um, but you did recently issue a statement supporting a law professor um, at UCSD who published what ended up being a controversial blog post on a group law blog called The Right Coast. And then there were calls for Smith's termination and the dean of the law school promised that, quote, there will be a process to review whether the university or law school policies have been violated. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the facts and maybe the process by which you and AFA members decided to get involved and, 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 and then how you responded. Yeah, so this is a case of a law professor at University of San Diego um, uh, Law School, and he is not a member of the AFA. So part of our commitment as an organization is that those who are members of the organization, um, um, we have a real commitment to making sure that we come to their defense if they find themselves in the midst of these controversies. Um, our hope is to be growing the organization over time in order to bring more people on board, um, but in a managed way, such our resources are capable of living up to that promise um, of uh, fulfilling those commitments to people they find themselves in those controversies. In his case, though, um, it became a visible public controversy that um, uh, unfortunately has become all too common. Um, in his case, it was a blog post, um, but in other cases, it's some social media post. Um, uh, but, th but the concern is similar in both kinds of instances. It's, it's a classic example of what the AUP characterizes as extramural speech. It's speaking out on political issues. In his case, um, it was making uh, public commentary about the behavior of the Chinese government uh, relative to the beginnings of the outbreak of the pandemic. And he uh, quoted a Wall Street Journal article um, raising questions about how uh, the Chinese government had responded and whether or not the Chinese government, in fact, was responsible uh, for uh, the artificial creation of the virus in its current form and its release. Um, and then uh, had a brief uh, statement expressing his own views on it, um, in which he included um, a, a point that we shouldn't, um, uh, I forgot exactly how he, uh, what the initial phrasing was, but uh, we, sh we shouldn't be uh, misled uh, by Chinese cockswaddle. And it's that phrasing that got him in trouble. Um, this was regarded as hate speech against uh, Chinese broadly, whereas I think in context was clearly about the Chinese government. He's later uh, emphasized he was talking about the Chinese uh, government uh, in particular. Um, but as is frequently the case, this led to student complaints in his, in his case that led to the university wanting to investigate. The university has characterized this as a kind of harassment um, claim. And I think if faculty are vulnerable for a single blog post commenting on political affairs um, to internal university sanction procedures on the claim that somehow that could be harassing um, of students who exist on, on campus, um, then the ability of faculty to be able to speak out in public on controversial issues is going to be severely uh, limited. And we see universities doing this over and over again. Um, it's critical that we call them out uh, when they do it. It's critical that we point out to universities their own uh, internal policies and commitments. University of San Diego has a set of free speech commitments um, that I think clearly protect the speech in this context. Um, and it's crucial then to make universities actually live up to that. Um, but San Diego has not yet done so. Um, we're hopefully they hopeful they eventually will, and we're doing what we can to try to put pressure on them and to help um, Professor Smith in this case um, to navigate the process um, to hopefully come to a better conclusion. 
Okay, thanks. Um, one of the questions um, in the queue from one of our participants kind of piggybacks on this, which is, um, what do you say about faculty members who use social media to self-promote, e.g. tweet about their scholarship, but then also use those same social media accounts to post political opinions or their opinions about their favorite Starbucks drink? Um, put another way, should professors be more careful in how they use social media? Should they have separate accounts, professional versus personal? Yeah, so until until we got to the Starbucks, it sounded like my Twitter account. So uh, so certainly, I, I'm I'm, like I'm typical in this in this regard, right? I use my Twitter account both to convey uh, things that are related to my scholarly work, um, uh, both in terms of directly promoting my scholarly work, but also talking about matters that I have some expertise in and trying to convey that expertise um, to the public when it's relevant for particular things. And then I also talk about the latest Marvel movie and and talk about politics in general and other unrelated matters. That's a natural way. Way of using social media. I think it's a completely appropriate way for faculty to be using social media. We want them to be engaged um, with the world more generally. And one virtue of social media in this regard is it does provide the opportunity for faculty to be responding in real time to uh, ongoing events that includes being able to share their expertise that's relate, re relevant to those events. Um, and so there, there's a real upside to having faculty involved in these kinds of things. But if um, uh, it's very easy to complain about faculty, they find themselves involved in controversial um, topics um, and people push back against that, then, then we're going to wind up chilling a lot of that speech and reducing the relevance of academia to the wider social world precisely because we wind up trying to bottle up all the expertise of academics um, and, and not allow them to try to uh, share it and elaborate on it and apply it um, uh, to particular context. But in order to take advantage of that, we have to be tolerant of the fact that people are sometimes going to post controversial and sometimes inflammatory things. That's just the nature of the beast. Partially goes along with the nature of social media as a mode of communication. Partially goes with the kind of topics under discussion um, in these in these contexts. And it's very hard to, I think, to draw a firm line between the things we might think of as controversial and inflammatory on the one hand and the things that actually relate closely um, to people's actual expertise uh, and scholarship um, on, on the other hand. So we, I think we need to have very broad protections for that. Um, the AUP has always emphasized that we also should have an aspiration that faculty, when they're contributing to public debates, are trying to elevate the conversation, not drag it down, um, that we should have some responsibility to try to convey things we think are truthful uh, rather than things that are not. I think those are important aspirations. We ought to, um, as academics, try to um, help and enlighten the population, uh, not just contribute to the heat of uh, polarized um, political debates. Um, at the same time, I don't think we want to regard that as a condition by, uh, by which faculty are allowed to uh, participate um, on social media. That becomes can easily become a weapon to be used against faculty and sometimes is by university administrators who want to say, well, you weren't um, uh, upholding high enough academic standards as you were posting something on Twitter. And as a consequence, we're now going to sanction you uh, for it. Um, so I think it's critically important that on the one hand, we, we recognize those aspirations and ideals. Um, it's what we hope academics can do. On the other hand, we don't want to empower university administrators to sanction faculty if they don't always live up to those ideals in practice. Yeah, I mean, I think if drawing the line were easy, we wouldn't need to be having this <laughs> right, and having organizations like AFA and AUP. Um, I want to spend a minute talking about state legislatures um, and kind of they're also trying to get into the mix and sort of draw lines. And I want to ask you about some legislation that's been passed, you know, recently, um, you know, in Florida a couple of weeks ago, a bill that calls to survey political beliefs of public college and university professors in order to make sure that there's ideological diversity. We have Louisiana, we have Iowa and then Idaho most recently, uh, introducing legislation that would bar instruction on divisive concepts. So I'm interested in what your thoughts are on this idea of trying to legislate um, academic freedom and viewpoint diversity. And then also, do you expect that AFA will get involved um, with legislative advocacy? So I don't expect that we'll be involved in legislative advocacy, um, at least not directly. And uh, anything I'm about to say certainly reflects my own personal opinions and not the institutional position of the organization. But it's, um, uh, but I think a lot of these bills are quite problematic in what they're and what they're trying to do. Um, I'm sometimes sympathetic with aspects of the goals. So for example, I do think that universities have not been very good about uh, intellectual diversity and trying to encourage a wide range of perspectives um, on academics um, uh, from faculty in, in particular. Um, so I, and I'm sympathetic to efforts to try to um, do a better job on that front. On the other hand, I would much prefer that that be solved in-house um, by universities and faculty acting on their own rather than uh, by those on the outside. 
Um, uh, and I think this is actually a bit of a warning that if universities don't do a better job of, of taking care of these matters in-house, we shouldn't be surprised if politicians uh, find themselves uh, wanting to get involved. But I also think this particular measure is just not a very good one substantively. So not only do I uh, think in general that politicians are not the right kind of people to be trying to micromanage how universities operate, this particular proposal of trying to survey faculty about their attitudes, try to uh, make mandates about how, as Florida's doing, and try to make mandates about um, how they ought to um, adjust uh, the faculty composition in response to that, authorizing students to film uh, faculty lectures, for example, in order to call them out if the students think that the faculty um, are, are, are uh, engaging politics in the classroom, for example, I think are all very troubling for how universities ought to operate and how um, uh, faculty can conduct themselves uh, more generally and is, is not a good tool, um, even for addressing the problem, which I think is a serious Serious one. The some of these other proposals are are effectively trying to gut tenure, make it easier to fire faculty in various circumstances, which certainly is not encouraging. This effort to sort of micromanage um, what the content of research and, and uh, teaching is going to look like, such as the banning us uh, from uh, pursuing controversial uh, topics, um, uh, cuts to the very heart of what it is universities are trying to do. So, for example, um, over the last couple of years, I taught a class at Princeton um, called Constitutional Difficulties in the Age of Trump. It was all about constitutional problems that arose during the Trump administration that had larger implications for presidential power. The very nature of that class is, is controversial, it involves controversial subject matters and controversial um, topics. Um, uh, you know, I may or may not have done the best job possible in, in trying to do that class. I certainly tried hard, um, but you can easily imagine if you have some state legislature looking over my shoulder, um, trying to assess, well, are you doing a good enough job teaching a class like this and are you being excessively controversial um, in how you're doing it? The result is I simply wouldn't try to teach that class at all. Um, and as a consequence, I would not be trying to do what I was trying to do, uh, which is allow students to get a more sophisticated understanding of the kind of constitutional problems that were arising over the last four years and how we ought to think about presidential power in a, in a modern context. Um, and you want universities, I think, to be doing exactly that. Um, but, but if you have students filming me in the classroom trying to do that, if you have legislatures uh, saying I can't be teaching uh, controversial material and they're going to be the ones assessing whether or not it's too controversial, um, uh, then that's just extraordinarily chilling about what we can actually uh, effectively do as faculty. Right, and that would certainly be a deep irony, right, is that the ultimate chilling of free speech and academic freedom in an attempt to encourage it. Um, I would hope that that's not what we're trying to do, but uh, yeah, I have to say, some of the way some of these bills are designed, you do wonder if that's not the goal instead of uh, 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 all things considered. I, I, I think that's a, a very valid point. Um, there is one other very essential question that's come up, which is whether or not you have a full set of Harry Potter books on your shelf. Um, I'm not gonna make you answer that, though I think if you have a full set of Harry Potter books, that's something about which you should be proud. Um, I have, we have if like- so, there are my daughters. I actually have never read Harry Potter, I have to admit. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm a- I'm a Tolkien guy, not a Potter oh, guy. I see. I got your yes. reason. All right, really fast. I don't know, just something sort of thinking about going back, going back to campus, being on camps, campus physically as we're thinking about academic freedom and these issues. Is there any kind of one or two things you think um, the folks today, you know, should be keeping in mind? What do you see kind of as you look ahead? Well, I mean, I think one thing that's coming back is is uh, it's likely we're going to have a lot more protest on campus. I mean, so we've been in a period in which there's been lots of social unrest and, and protest activity more broadly. Uh, uh, in the middle of this context of the pandemic, it's also true universities have been shut down for the most part and students haven't been around. I think we're going to find students back on campus and, as, and have the same desire to continue engaging this kind of protest activity that's been occurring in society more generally. Universities should be prepared for that. Uh, universities have long been a home for protest activities of various sorts, and we want to make space on university campuses for that. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised um, if we don't see a fair amount of that kind of activity. We should be fairly tolerant of it. Um, there obviously are limitations and rules. We don't want that to be disruptive of what else we're trying to accomplish on university campuses. But I do expect we're both going to see protests on campus. and We're going to get a lot of political backlash um, to protest on campus. It's going to heighten these tensions uh, where uh, people look at uh, university campuses and think, uh, I don't like what's going on there. Um, and really, it'd be a good idea if, if somebody else uh, came in and intervened in order to shut down the stuff I don't like. 
Yeah. Well, listen, I really appreciate your taking not only your time, but time from your class um, to join us. I look forward to continuing uh, the conversation and wish you and AFA all the best as you plunge in um, to this area. And, you know, it's hard to believe, you know what they say, time flies when you're having fun. Hopefully <laughs> everybody was uh, has enjoyed themselves. We are, you know, at the close of a really, what I think was a thought provoking and dynamic day. And if you enjoyed today's programming and you'd like to support the work at the center, um, you can make a donation through our website, um, which is at www.freespeechcenter.universityofcalifornia.edu. Um, if you're interested in um, supporting our, um, our sponsoring, sorry, our 2022 Speech Matters Conference or any other programming of ours, please reach out to me directly. Um, I hope that all of you will be joining us tomorrow. Um, Keith, without knowing it, gave a perfect plug. We are going to be um, starting the day talking to five leading UC activists. And then we're going to be hearing from the co-chairs of the center's board, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky and Chancellor Howard Gilman, as well as from experts on democratic learning and engagement. Tune in, same time, same place, same link, 10 a.m. PST and 1 p.m. EST. See you then. Thanks so much.